it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to 83 Weeks with Eric Bischoff. Eric, what's going on, man? How are you? It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood. <laughs> oh it is, though. It's a beautiful day. This is uh, a fun time of year for us because I know we're both big holiday season fans. We get to spend time with family and all that. And we're right around the corner from Thanksgiving. It's next week. So of course we're going to be talking about some things that we're thankful for here on the program. Mostly today where we'll be celebrating the life and times of Mr. Ted Turner and all the time that Eric spent with him. We've gotten lots of requests for this show. Uh, we've always been kind of hesitant to do it, but today we're going to do our best to pay great tribute to a great man. Uh, but before we do that, we should talk about that great photo behind you. Hopefully you're watching with us, uh, 83 weeks over on YouTube, but man, check that out from paintyourlife.com. Eric Christmas came early at your household. It did indeed. And I'm, I'm so happy because as you know, you've been looking at my tree house here that I call a studio. It's actually out in the bunk house, but, um, you know, it's kind of it's a lot of wood, not a lot of color. <laughs> <laughs> so now it pops and I've never kept it a very few things that I keep as wrestling related memorabilia up over what is my right shoulder. You can see the uh, plaques that I got there from WWE when I was inducted to the hall of fame and a couple pictures of me and Muhammad Ali and one up there that you can't see a Jay Leno. That's the extent really of my collectibles. So now I've got a right there smack dab in the middle I've got a piece of history in oil, an oil framed painting of one of the most, I don't know, I think it's significant, not the most, but certainly in the top five. Oh, it's gotta be the oh. most significant of your career, right? No, my career, but I'm thinking about the wrestling industry as a whole, because so much changed as a result of the Monday night wars and the competition between the two companies and, you know, just the elevation of the product across the boards. You know, it, it changed. I think a big reason that WWE was able to go public and eventually sell to Endeavor is largely because of the Attitude Era, the Monday Night Wars, the competitive nature of it, and how everybody's ratings went up. And and ultimately, WWE ended up you know, winning that war. But the process of fighting it over the couple, three, four years is one of the things that I think elevated the industry so much. And it kind of started with that moment. It's, it really is a piece of history. You could dissect it, look at it a million different ways, but you know, other than Vince McMahon kind of deciding he was going to evaporate the territories and snag all the top talent, you know, regionally and create this national promotion consistent with the expansion of cable television. That was to, in my mind, as far as things that really changed the business, that's number one, but this has got to be close, brother. It's got to be close. Of course, we're talking about the fabulous uh, painting that we ordered from paintyourlife.com and we revealed it on social media this past week. Uh, you can get one just in time for Christmas. Just text the word gift to eight, seven, two, zero, four. That's gift G I F T to eight, seven, two, zero, four, get your free shipping and 20% off. No, I know. And, and I don't mean to jump you there kind of, but the thing that still amazes me, like when I first came out here this morning to get everything set up and make sure all my stuff was working, I, I looked at the painting and, and I know Dave Silva just showed us some of the close-ups of it, but the detail yeah. in that picture, I mean, look at Scott Hall's face. I mean, that's Scott Hall and Kevin and Hulk. I mean, just the detail in this, in, I don't know. It's so cool. I'm turning into an art fan. I've never been interested in oil paintings. Now all of a sudden I am. Well, listen, it's a great gift, but, uh, Eric, I, uh, I don't know how to tell you this, but I didn't kind of anticipate you hanging this up in the bunkhouse. You didn't anticipate me hanging it up in the bunkhouse. No, I was kind of thinking maybe we could, you know, do something for a great cause with that painting. Cause like collectors like me. They'd probably pay a lot of money for that. And I thought maybe we could just raise some money for St. Jude's or something. Ugh. And maybe you get Kevin Nash to sign it and you sign it and you get Hulk Hogan to sign it. Cause I think you're going to be down in Florida at the end of the, uh, at the beginning of next year for our top guy rumble. I don't know. Just thinking maybe we could do something nice for somebody. And, but you, 
sort of hung that one up already. Can we? Well, I thought it was mine. Isn't that the best gift? The gift of giving. I mean, St. Jude's, you really going to deprive those kids of that opportunity? You, you nail me with St. Jude's. You got me to shave my head for St. Jude. <laughs> That's like your thing. You know, you know, all I got to hit do is hit the St. Jude's button. Oh, yeah. He's going to do whatever I ask him to do. Kryptonite Jones. All right, let's do it. Okay. All let's right. Let's do it. So next week we'll have uh, all the information about how you can own that painting. Oh, wow. Let's get a wide shot of that again. So I know you've got a full picture shot. This was hand done and it's framed and ready to go. Oh, and wow. uh, the rumor and innuendo is Eric's going to be in Florida over the holidays anyway. So maybe we can snag a couple of signatures, but we know for sure we can get easy E on there, but this is one of one man. And we're going to be raising some money for St. Jude. So stay tuned next week, but Eric, don't worry. I'm not done with you. Eric Bischoff, this is your life part two coming up this week on social media. Oh, Check it out at 83 this. weeks. You planned this. Well, this wasn't just a random gift showing up my, at my door, which is what I thought it was. This is now, this is a Conrad Thompson strategy. Yeah, a little bit. Eric Bischoff, uh, this is your life. Stay tuned to social media this week at 83 okay. weeks. And if you want to get something like that for your family, uh, be sure to use the promo code gift. Just text the word gift to eight, seven, two, zero, four, get you 20% off and free shipping just in time for the holidays. Of course, uh, somebody is not going to need any discounts because they're cashing in big. The news went pretty wide this past week that, uh, well, there was a statement that everybody started to post again from the most recent filings report from the WWE that they basically said that we recognize that. Vince McMahon being part of our organization as a potential threat to our company. And he turned around and sold like 8 million shares or announced his intention to sell like 8 million shares. So, uh, Vinny Mac going to be pocketing like $700 million here. Just any day now. What do you make yeah, of that? But news? is that before or after taxes? Well, you got to assume it's going into some sort of trust, right? Like these guys aren't just pulling cash out and it's not going into checking account. I'll tell you that. What do you think of this news that Vince is, uh, converting a little cash? You know, I don't know if it's just the way you presented the facts because you just, you didn't editorialize. You didn't, yeah. you didn't, there was no intonation that somehow you were trying to make a point subtly, but just in terms of timing, it was announced that Vince McMahon is a risk. And then he sell, then he sells whatever it is, 8 million shares. Mm -hmm. Do you think that that was a response? Do you think, do you think that was a, oh, I'm a risk. Am I? Well, screw you. I'm going to dump a ton of stock in the market and see how you feel about that. Is that the way you took it? I just a thought. I don't know that Vince is bitter that way, but timing was interesting. That's a lot of, that's a lot of money just to make a point, <laughs> you know, but you can't, you know, you, he's still human, you know, he's still flawed. I could, got that much money. Maybe it's a good, uh, maybe it's a good fuck you. I don't know. Of course, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we saw prior to the Saudi Arabian show, we saw Vince McMahon with the undertaker at the Tyson Fury fight. And he actually did a little media. And during that interview, he referenced the new venue that had been built for the Tyson Fury fight as being the new home of WWE. Now, a lot of people took that to mean home of WWE in Saudi Arabia. This is where we're going to run our shows when we're over here. And other people said, no, nope, he meant they're going to try to do more business there. They're going to try to make an effort to grow WWE there in Saudi Arabia. That is the new home. Now, of course we know at the same time, they just opened up their brand new office and brand new building. And I think they even, uh, the day before veterans day erected that 3000 square foot flag which is unbelievable. The largest American flag now waves over the new WWE corporate headquarters in Stamford, Connecticut. What do you think? Do you think, cause listen, when, when Vince sold that, oh, just a couple of that amount of stock, just a couple of weeks removed from that interview where he said, this is the new home of WWE. A lot of, uh, conspiracy theorists, a lot of people wearing some tinfoil hats are saying maybe Vince is going to try to do something else with the Saudi Arabians outside of WWE. And I say, that's crazy talk. What say you? 
I'd say it's crazy simply because I'm sure there are terms within Vince's agreement that would prevent him from competing in any meaningful way. Um, so I, yeah. And at this stage of his life, it's just going to move to Saudi Arabia or be there on a regular basis. I can't see that either. Um, but <laughs> dude is a wild card. Yeah. I, nothing when it comes to Vince McMahon, nothing surprises me. Yeah. Nothing. And I know, you know, we're, we're here to talk about Ted Turner. And one of the things that I want to talk about as we dig into Ted a little bit, but I'll, I'll set the tone here for a moment is the similarities between Ted Turner and Vince McMahon. Mm. I've never thought about it until Derek Sabato reached out and said, Oh, here's the notes. And I'm looking through the notes and I'm flashing back to a, a book that I read a long time ago. And I tried to find it so I could bone up on it and read it again before this, this interview. The, uh, I think the name of the book is called it ain't as easy as it looks by an author by the name of Porter Bibb. Now there's been several biographies written about Ted Turner over the years. The most recent one by Bill Burke, who used to be the president of TBS when I was there and I worked closely with Bill. Um, but Porter Bibb, was someone who was close to Ted. I, I think he was a good friend of Ted's. But re regardless of that, wrote the first biography. And it, it, it did such a fascinating job of describing Vince's, or excuse me, Ted's upbringing. And there's, there begins a lot of similarities. You know, troubled kids, really fractured relationship, Ted at least with his father. His father was an alcoholic, beat him regularly tough on him, sent him to military school. And of course, you know, we know Vince's background a little bit different, but it's kind of the same type of youth and, and fractured relationship with the father and all that. But Ted, Ted was an amazing visionary. And so is Vince. Now I, you know, I can't really put them side by side and say they're equal because I don't think anybody as an entrepreneur you look at the things that Ted Turner did. And again, we'll talk about it more in a few moments, but in terms of professional wrestling, I think it's hard to deny that Vince McMahon is without question, a visionary. And as a visionary and an entrepreneur and a guy who refuses to be his age with a lot of money on his hands, maybe he's going to do something different. Maybe it's not wrestling per se, but something different. Um, that's based in Saudi, or at least the operations are, and Vince will be a big part of that. That I could see because there's so much potential there. Look what's going on in, in with the Saudis and their investment in sports, and perhaps Vince sees an opportunity there to spin off into another form of sports entertainment or another business completely and, uh, and do it over in Saudi because he's got the money to do it with, he's got the time, and he thinks he's 24, so... Who knows? Maybe I'm with you. I think he could be doing something. I just don't think it'll be a competitive space for WWE. I mean, we saw what Dana white did with power slap, and I know that was not without controversy. And certainly a lot of people have been critical of it. And I think a lot of that criticism is fair. However, he did an interview over the weekend where he said, Hey, I've never revealed this publicly, but it's a $450 million company. And that was the first time we heard that. And that is Dana White's spinoff, if you will, from the UFC, then I could see, I mean, we've seen Vince try this before with the WBF, with the XFL, like what is this next thing going to be for Vince? You got to assume if he's converting stock, he's either doing it to be in a pissing contest or he's getting ready for his next play. Let me ask you a question. Cause I'm a little murky, mostly because I don't follow it closely enough, but not too long ago, we're talking maybe six, eight weeks ago. It was announced that Saudi was going to invest in a competitive MMA league. That's right. Correct. Yep. Now, just within weeks, we've seen, and I've read and listened to Dana White talking about how Vince McMahon was a key element to arranging business between UFC and Saudi. Right. Yep. That's interesting. Isn't it? It is interesting. Makes because you wonder. One would think that if Saudi was interested in launching their own MMA company, um, that that would preclude or exclude, I should say 
um, UFC from doing any business with them because why would you spend hundreds of millions of dollars bringing in your competition? Maybe Vince's position here in this mystery is that he is going to be somehow involved in the relationship mm. that involves Saudi and the expansion of UFC in Saudi. I don't know. It's going to be interesting to see what's happening there. I know everybody is, uh, sort of rubbing their hands together, like waiting on the other shooter drop, whatever that looks like with Vince McMahon and WWE. And I feel like they're also doing that about CM Punk. There's been a lot more stories that have started to come to the forefront where people are bringing around all these different theories. Of course, we are just days away from the big AEW pay-per-view and that's happening this weekend at the forum in Los Angeles. It's a Saturday night pay-per-view. And I guess the suggestion is with MJF, once again, defending the ring of honor tag team titles on the pregame show this time against the guns. And he's looking for a partner as we're recording this in the main event. He's with the uh, title with uh, Jay white. Lots of people have started to speculate who is under that devil mask. Is it Jack Perry? Is it Tony Khan? Oh my God, please. No. Is it CM please Punk? No. Who is it? And then there's other people who say, oh no, CM Punk can't be at that show because he's at the pay-per-view the following weekend, the Saturday after Thanksgiving, uh, he's going to be at survivor series doing war games. And they just announced that they are indeed bringing war games back. I personally think that's super cool that Cody Rhodes is finally going to get to wrestle in a match that was maybe made famous and created by his own father. First time I think Cody's been in a war game. So I'm pretty excited about that. But a lot of people are saying CM Punk's going to be there because it's Chicago. Has your opinion about where CM Punk lands changed at all? Well, I still think it's a remote possibility. I've, I've never come out and said, there's no way it'll ever happen. I know better than that for crying out loud. I've been involved in too many things that everybody thought would never happen. Right. Um, so, but I do feel that it's extremely remote one, just because logically WWE doesn't need them. Their business is strong. They're selling out everywhere they go for TV. Um, their finances are, are there each time they present them their records. So I don't, I don't know where the need would be. I certainly don't believe it would be in Chicago this weekend. I just don't because there's definitely no need there. Tickets are already sold out. What are you going to, why do it? Um, obviously there's a much bigger audience than just that audience in Chicago. But again, I'll go back to what I just stated. They don't really need it. Oh, my dog just came in and blew me out. Um, they just, WWE doesn't need it. Now, Royal Rumble going into WrestleMania, I could buy that as a possibility because it makes sense. Even though they don't need punk by any stretch of the imagination, there is absolutely zero need for him. However, getting that surge of momentum and that reaction that, you know, you would get, especially because of the nature of Royal rumble, it's just built for that kind of thing. Um, the buzz going into WrestleMania that's a period of time when you want every bit of buzz you can get. I could see that happening, but I just don't see it happening in Chicago. Now watch it'll fucking happen in Chicago. I'll, <laughs> I'll take my average down to below 80% again. I hate that. Well, I don't know about that. Here's what I do know. If you're wanting to go to the forum this weekend, or if you're wanting to go to Chicago for the war games next weekend, you got to check out our friends at game time. I've told the story before, but my daughter hit me up just a few months ago and she was just hours before the show and asked if I could get her tickets to a big concert here in town. And I thought no problem. I bought so much radio and TV over the years here. I can just make a couple of calls. I can get some comps. Ah, ah, totally sold out. Absolutely no chance of tickets. The fastest sellout in the history of the venue for Lana Del Rey. I didn't even know who that was. And I'm like, wait, how did this happen? And then I remembered, aha, the game time app. 
Not only did dad come through, she got front row tickets and it was cheaper than I could find last row tickets online. Okay. That's not exactly true. It's $20 more, but for $20 more, instead of sitting on the absolute last row, she got to sit front row. I was super dad. I took more pride in that moment than I can remember. I mean, what a, what a great way to make someone's day. They're asking for tickets and you can come through with primo tickets. Game time was my secret ingredient. They will be for you too. use this for a date, for a spouse, for a grit, for a gift, uh, for a father-in-law or whoever. This is a home run. You get last minute tickets, you get flash deals, you get zone deals, and they just eliminate all the guesswork with the game time app. You can get a POV shot of what your ticket's going to look like. What I mean is we've all seen a seat map before and we're like, okay, that looks like a good ticket, but is it? Well, from here you get the perspective of, oh, okay, this is what my view will be like. That eliminates all the risk. Speaking of that, let's talk about the peace of mind you get with game time. They've got a game time guarantee where it means they guarantee you'll always get the best price. Here's how it works. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less money, game time will credit you 110% of the difference, not a hundred percent to make sure you got the best deal. They're going to get you the best deal by 10%. They credit you 110% of the difference. It's unbelievable. I highly recommend it. And it's last minute. So if, if you missed it, it's, oh, it's tonight. No problem. Game time's got you. Well, it says it's sold out. No problem. Game time's got you. Well, I don't want to overpay. No problem. Game time's got you for football, for basketball, for baseball, for concerts, for comedy, for theater. Just take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. Here's what you do. You download the game time app. You create an account and you use the code weeks. We'll get you $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again, create an account and redeem the code weeks. That's W E E K S for $20 off download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So Eric, let's talk about some other news and notes. Uh, we've got, uh, the big AEW pay-per-view coming up this weekend. They've built a really nice card for that. Uh, we've also seen an announcement that there is a Sega co-promotion with dynamite. We saw not too long ago, the, uh, Texas chainsaw massacre death match with, uh, Jeff Hardy and Jeff Jarrett. And a lot of people panned it online and were critical of it. But I think what they forget was Tony donated not only the entire gate that weekend to charity for that show, but he donated all of the money that was brought in for that partnership for the video game. Now we've got another one here, a video game co-op with Sega. I like the idea that we're seeing more tie-ins with matches as a, as a advertiser. These are the type of ads I would want. I want to be sort of in game. I want to be in show content. I, I don't want to be, you know, somewhere in the stop set in a commercial break, make me part of the program. Is this the new, uh, the new way of doing business and making money in the wrestling business? Do you think? Sure. Seems that way. Doesn't it? And it makes sense. You know, it's product placement. Product placement has been around since forever. Yeah. Uh, it became really, um, financially it, it created its own market back around the early 2000s when reality programming became a thing and it started to explode. Part of that was because of the writer's strike, of course. Part of that was because it was new and it was different. You know, reality television, unscripted television was very popular in Europe, Australia, long before it became popular in the United States. It kind of migrated here, really. Be- you know, not, not any one person, but Mark Burnett had a lot to do with it. Real World was one of the first reality shows, but financially insignificant. Where if you look at what uh, Survivor did, that was an entirely new business model and really changed the industry, the television industry. And part of that was product placement. Because as a reality unscripted television producer, you just had a lot more leeway to include products in shots in, in ways that, as opposed to just having a, you know, uh, a bottle of whiskey with the, you know, a, a label that everybody recognizes, kind of position on the bar in a shot. In non-scripted programming, you can make it a part of the show, and in a very organic way, that certainly connects with 
viewers much differently than an advertisement would because we're all trained, conditioned, consciously even to tune out commercials. Our brains just automatically start tuning stuff out unless it's a very, very good commercial. Um, this is a, a great way. And if wrestling is finding ways, if Tony's finding ways and WWE, as we've seen, has found ways, I just think that makes one more thing that makes that genre so much more valuable than scripted programming. And in some respects, even more so than sports programming, because you don't have that latitude in sports. It's a much different environment. So I, I hope we see more of it. You know, the key, I think Conrad is going to be doing it in a tasteful way yep. that has a positive impact on the advertiser without overdoing it so much that it becomes too obvious and, and the viewer start pushing back. But I think that, you know, we're used to seeing, you know, product placement and so many other things. I, I think it's, unless it's really egregious on the part of the producer, there's a lot of room to do product placement and make it feel like it's part of the programming, which is really, it's, it's a great opportunity. I really look forward to these type things. I like it. I do think it's the future. I think, um, I would rather see these type environments for this sort of thing. Like I remember a few years ago, maybe it wasn't even that long ago. Miz was taken over and eaten by zombies as a part of the walking dead. And I understand the walking dead just paid an absolute mint for that. So I'm happy for that, but like, I can't help, but think about like that Nick gauge, Chris Jericho match where he starts using a pizza cutter and they immediately go to a Domino's thing. And that was an accidental thing. But if I was Domino's rather than running from that, I would have been excited about that. Like you're making me part of the program. And like when you and I go back and we do a watch along and we're watching like an old nitro and we're hearing from Lee Marshall, we see that one, 800 collect thing right on screen, right on screen or that call ATT, whatever it is. Uh, but we would do the same thing with like the Valvoline replay. Like that in program content is still on the network long after that check's been cashed to another company. It's still there. So having that sort of forward thinking to make yourself a part of the content, I think is really a good play and a good value for the advertiser as well. So I'm excited to see more of it. And, and especially at a time Conrad, when the world, you know, advertising is, is a more difficult industry now than it's probably ever been with regard to television, because, because of streaming, because of the decline in network, because of, you know, the deterioration in cable for that matter, all of a sudden now, you know, your digital advertising budgets are increasing. Your linear television budgets are decreasing. So if you're still advertising on television or you're producing or you're a network, you've got to do whatever you can to make your commercials or, or advertising within your shows as attractive as it can be. And again, wrestling is the one program where you can really find a lot of creative ways to do it. And I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I, I think it's an exciting development in the business of the wrestling business. Well, let's talk about the business of the wrestling business. Um, but before we do, I think we should talk a little bit about football because football season's here. I'm having such a great time with football season. I'm having a lot of fun busting Jeff Jarrett's balls about his hapless Tennessee volunteers, I'm having a lot of fun busting Tony Schiavone's balls about being an all of a sudden Jaguars fan. But what I really enjoy is being able to play daily fantasy sports, not just against strangers, but against myself. I'm talking about our friends at prize picks. This has been a new hobby of mine this off season. I think this is the most fun I've had playing daily fantasy sports because I'm not playing other people. I'm just playing against the numbers. Let me explain instead of battling pros and sharks, because that's who's in those other leagues. I'm just picking more than or less than on a couple of different player stat projections and watching the money roll in prospects and even help you win 25 extra money this football season. And now you can even play basketball. You just select two or more players and then pick more than or less than on their projected stats and place your industry, your entry. It really is that easy. For example, is Joe Burrow going to throw for more than two passing touchdowns? Is Travis Kelsey going to have more than 75 receiving yards? That's it. You pick more than or less than like Christian McCaffrey. Is he going to have more than or less than 75 rushing yards? 
What about your boy, Patrick Mahomes? Is he going to have more than two passing touchdowns? Or is he going to have less than and over in basketball? What about Stephen Curry? 29 points more than or less than see it's that simple. I absolutely love this. I think you will too. They've even got a reboot policy. So your entries stay in play, even if one of your players get injured, get injured. So like for football and basketball games, let's say you have a player who exits the game in the first half and doesn't come back in the second. Well, that player is rebooted. And as far as I know, prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform that has that injury insurance policy. I think it's really cool. And they've even got lots of fun folks who are playing this game now. Uh, with prize picks. We're talking about guys like Meek Mill, one of my favorite rappers, one of my favorite comedians, Andrew Schultz. He's on it too. You can even find community plays under the promos tab of the app. To view some of the entries from some of the bigger names and entertainment, everybody is playing prize picks. You will be too. Test your skills. Find out how easy it is. If you got the skills, man, turn 10 bucks into 250 bucks and they make it so easy. You can make your picks and get them submitted in less than 60 seconds. They got quick withdrawals, dude. They're even doing Apple pay now. So they make it super easy to make your deposits. Oh, and they're running promotions. How about taco Tuesday? They discount player selection projections up to 25% to provide even more value. There's a reason prize picks is the number one daily fantasy sports app. And we want you to try it. Go right now to prizepickscom slash 83 weeks. Use our code 83 weeks for a first deposit match of up to hundred dollars. That's prizepickscom slash 83 weeks. Use the code 83 weeks for a first deposit match up to a hundred bucks. That's prizepicks.com slash 83 weeks. Use the code 83 weeks. You're going to love prospects daily fantasy sports made easy. Let's talk about the wrestling business. Then we're going to talk about Ted Turner. Boy, there was a lot of news going around this last week. Now we sort of had part one of the news last week where Billy Corgan, I guess, pushed for and advocated for according to the story as the legend goes a cocaine spot on the most recent NWA pay-per-view. He does this on the heels of announcing that he's got not one, but two shows with a top 20 cable network, but he will not reveal who it is, but the internet figured out, oh, it's the CW. So everyone starts reporting it's the CW. I don't think it's ever formally or officially announced by Billy Corgan, but on the heels of that quote unquote cocaine spot, lots of speculation that folks at CW were not thrilled with that. And in fact, the TV opportunity may be in jeopardy. Maybe now it's just going to become a streaming show. And a couple of days later, they announced that NXT's new home is the CW. So once upon a time, I know behind the scenes, there were a couple of folks working on bringing wrestling to the CW. I guess at the last minute, it looked like ta-da, nope, Billy Corgan got it. And then the big announcement heard an expression an old man told me a long time ago, the money always goes where it belongs. Well, it belongs with NXT and WWE CW has this opportunity. Now, what'd you make of this news? And did you see Billy Corgan's response where he says he can't reveal, but there's been lots of speculation and lots of misinformation and it's not true. Everything he said is true and you'll, we'll see soon enough. What do you make of this? It, it's, it's funky. <laughs> funky like a monkey baby it's funky as hell i on strictly business um last week we had a chance to john alba and i had a chance to talk to mike johnson from pw insider mike johnson by the way is the person who broke the news before anybody else on nxt going to cw and mike had been following things going on at cw for quite some time and i don't want to put words in mike's mouth i encourage people to go to uh, strictly business and, and hear the interview because yes. it was a very interesting interview, but I believe Mike has some great sources within CW and the whole Corrigan moving NWA to again, according to Mike Johnson now, uh, it was never a conversation. It was never in play. The conversation that was in play between C and CW and Corrigan was for a self-funded self-funded non-scripted series about Billy and his life. And I'm sure wrestling was in the background. That was a discussion. Uh -huh. There was never a discussion about NWA. Mm. So in typical internet wrestling community fashion, mm. 
you know, Mike Johnson, who sat on a lot of the stuff that he had until he was absolutely sure everybody right. else, the Dave Meltzer's of the world all run and start spewing forth all kinds of garbage about CW and NWA and all oh, the cocaine spot cratered the opportunity. The fucking opportunity never existed in the first place. Oh, so the spot didn't create anything or, or destroy any opportunity because it wasn't there in the first place. It wasn't a topic of conversation. There was not a negotiation. There wasn't a deal pending. It's a figment of the internet wrestling community imagination and the fun that everybody has taking a little kernel of a, a, a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of truth or fact and then building a Taj Mahal of bullshit on top of it. So that's what I think about that. As far as Billy teasing a top 20 network, whatever. I don't know Billy well enough. I've read nothing against Billy at all. I don't know him well enough to read him or try to, I, uh, but I'm throwing, I'm throwing a flag on that. I just, yeah, he could probably be talking to the top 20 network. He's probably going to pay f- for the show. It's going to be a buy on that doesn't take any particular talent. It certainly doesn't make your brand worth anything. You're just another fishing show. Take out the fish in the boat and put in wrestlers. And there's your business model. It's been around forever. So who knows? We'll see. I hope for the best. You know, I, I don't know. I sound you know, like I'm taking shots at Billy, I don't mean to, but I am taking shots at this kind of bullshit, cloudy, murky. I guess it's promotion. I don't really even feel like it's promotion, but it's just, I guess, Billy's way of proving that there's still a pulse at NWA and he's still pursuing it. And I, I guess there's nothing wrong with that, but don't be so murky in the process, Billy. Be straightforward. You're a straight shooting guy. Just keep doing it. There's a lot of talented people who work there, uh, in the NWA. I mean, you go back a few years and man, they had Thunder Rosa on that show and they had, uh, LA Knight on that show and they had Eddie Kingston on that show and homicide and Ricky Starks and so much other great talent. And I know that's a few, we're a few years removed from that, but still, you know, this is another guy like Dixie Carter before him and, and Tony Khan after him, I suppose who is a, a man who's had a lot of a person who's had a lot of success and has the financial capacity and has a vision and, and he's trying his best to put his money where his mouth is, but it feels like since the pandemic, man, they've really struggled to get momentum going again. And, uh, of course there was the, uh, I don't know, maybe ugly. We might call it departure of, of Nick Aldis. And a lot of people thought he was sort of synonymous with that brand. And now we see him as the GM on SmackDown. What, if anything, do you think Billy Corgan can do to pull the nose up on this thing and get some positive momentum going for the NWA? Because him being successful there would be great for the entire industry. The only thing that Billy Corgan could do was to sit down with his financial team and determine how much money he personally has invested in NWA at this point. Maybe add to that a little bit, throw a couple million more in have enough of your own skin in the game and then go out and raise a boatload of money because until and unless he takes that show on the road and you create the live event, which which is where the rights fees are. It's just right in your face. It's not, there's no question about it. WWE is getting the money that they're getting. AEW, potentially is going to get whatever money they're going to get in because they've established themselves as a live action destination with a significant audience each and every week. That's what Billy needs to do. Billy can bring in all the talent in the world. He wants to, it's not a talent issue. It's a, it's a scale issue. As long as NWA is promote produced in these little tiny venues with little tiny audiences, you're never going to be have, you're never going to be able to have an adult conversation with someone in programming or some executive studio or network about making this a real thing. It's got a tour and it's expensive. That's where the investment is. The investment TNA learned it. I mean, TNA could have and should have been in business to this very day. They wouldn't make the move. They wouldn't make the move to invest long-term in touring the television show 
and establishing the fact that this was a live action attraction each and every week in prime time, had they done that with Spike TV, now Viacom, it would be a different world today. But they refused to do it for whatever their reasons were. And that's what NW, that's what Corgan has to do. He has to be able to put together a group of investors. And they're out there, folks. They are out there. This would not be, you know, I wouldn't want to be doing it at this stage of my life. But if I was 20 years younger and I was looking at the state of the industry the way it is right now and the opportunities that still exist as a result of it, I, I would find a way to raise $100 million or more knowing that it's going to take five to seven years to get a return on that investment, but the return on that investment would be substantial. And I would go out there and become a legitimate number two or three because Tony Khan's vulnerable. AEW as content is vulnerable. And if somebody were to come out and put together a program that you could produce in front of three or 4,000 people, because that's all Tony Khan's doing. They're lucky to get 4,000 people at, 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 a, at a, uh, a live dynamite and even less for collision or rampage. So it's not like it can't be done, but you have to have the balls and the money and the patience to do it. Other than that, it's a vanity project for Billy Corgan, and he's going to continue spinning his – he's going to have fun in his little hamster wheel until he's not having fun, and it'll go away. But it's never going to be worth anything unless it scales up. I'm pulling for him. I uh, I appreciate when a guy has a vision and puts his money where his mouth is and goes out of his way to try to create jobs and opportunities. And I know there's been a lot of people who've taken a lot of – uh joy and dunking on the perceived loss of this television deal and, and the perceived L for the NWA. I'm not one of them. I don't, I don't think that's good for wrestling. I think, you know, I want every promotion to do better and better. Um, I am curious what's next for the NWA though, because if, if they're not going to be doing the CW thing, I kind of thought, man, that's, that's the break they were looking for. And like we've seen, you know, MLW certainly, and I guess they have got a lawsuit with WWE about it. Cause I guess they had a, a show and then allegedly reportedly there's evidence that maybe WWE put the kibosh on that, but it feels like this is sort of the same thing, but you're saying in your conversation with Mike Johnson over on strictly business, that was never the case. And this is just right time, right place for WWE and CW, right? Yeah, no, I know. Apparently, because this is the first time I've heard CW within a, a, the context of a professional wrestling conversation. But apparently, if, again, I read it, I don't know if it's true, and I, I can't even credit where I heard it. I typically would do that or where I read it. But evidently, uh, CW approached Tony Khan a while back. I've heard that. about pos- I'm sorry? I heard that, and I heard it was true, that they were interested in Ring of Honor. Isn't that funny? And I guess, you know, I mean, I know some folks who were working on a show that they had a whole plan and it was a good plan. And I got excited about the plan about doing a weekly show live, uh, on CW. I, I shouldn't share any more details, but like it was pretty far down the road. And then I, I think that sort of went cold on them a little bit. And maybe it was because. Billy had heard. So maybe Billy made a play. That's certainly what a lot of tinfoil hat wearing folks were thinking. And, and I guess this whole announcement of NXT now looking for a home bubbled to the surface, but I guess, yeah, somewhere along the way, there was at least an interest with Tony Khan about, or, or, or an interest on the CW side about getting ring of honor television on CW. And I guess Tony felt like he needed that card to up the rights value of the AW deal. What do you think of that strategy? Like, yes, we could use our, our B property ring of honor and go get them a, a much better viable opportunity with CW, or we could use that as maybe a chess piece and bring it out when we need to for our bigger opportunity, the AEW deal. I can see both sides of that. You know, part of me, part of me would probably lean towards diversifying and using a show to get on CW 
because you just don't want to be in a position, trust me when I tell you, where all of your eggs are in one basket in anything, whether it be stocks or real estate holdings or licensing deals with television studios, <laughs> you know, you want to, or networks, you want as much diversification as you could get. And, you know, that's one of the things, again, on Strictly Business, we talked about at length was how you look at WWE now and they've got NXT lined up on a network. You've got SmackDown lined up on cable and potentially Raw lined up on a streaming platform. It makes more sense now than it ever has for that very reason, because now you're diversified. You're not putting all of your eggs in one basket or even two. Now you're, you're spread across three opportunities. And if you're, if you're Nick Khan and you've been led to believe, or, or you just believe that CW is making an attempt to grow their audience, there's nothing wrong with being a big fish in a small pod especially if that big fish is NXT, which is your third string brand. And now you've got a foothold in network. It's, it's pretty smart. And I, if I were Tony in that position that he theoretically was in or supposedly was in with CW, I think I would have planted a flag just for the diversification and because it gives you leverage in future negotiations because TBS would know that you have other opportunities, viable ones. I, I think that would have been a smart move, but I also understand the play that he would make and want to have as much leverage with his television partner as, as he could have going into negotiations. So I, I see it both ways, but if I would have had to make a decision in Tony's shoes, I would have diversified. I think I would have too. you know, that's, um, but you know, he's a billionaire and we're not. So yeah, but he didn't make that billion dollars. Oh, you? come on. I'm just, no, 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 no. But that's, I mean, we're talking about business. You don't think when he consults say, his dad, yeah, but he's a the billionaire decisions. that implies that he has the vision and the experience and the entrepreneurial you know, qualities and all of the things that it takes to become a billionaire. Tony inherit, Tony inherited his money. He didn't make his money. And that's important when you're talking about a judgment, like we were just talking about in context. You think he doesn't communicate with his dad? It's not the same thing, brother. Okay. Let's talk about manscaped. Eric Bischoff has grotesque dick hair or he did, but it was so much. It was like he had a werewolf and a head scissor down there. It was bad. <laughs> Just gray hair. As far as you can see. I mean, it was sticking out of his shorts. He came swimming over the summer here at the Conradison and I told him I wouldn't tell anybody and I'm betraying confidences because I'm a whore and he came over and it looked like the scarecrow from the wizard of Oz. You know how the straw just stuck out. Well, that's what it was in his banana hammock. He never got the memo. You're not wearing banana hammocks anymore. He thought he was on the bruise cruise circa 95. And, uh, well, we, we got him tackled. We held that rascal down and Mrs. B went to business with the manscaped lawnmower 5.0 ultra. And now it's the unsung hero of the holiday season. It's time to go cold Turkey on your old razor and take care of your own Turkey leg with the lawnmower 5.0 ultra visit manscaped.com. Use our promo code 83 weeks. We'll get you 20% off and free shipping. And you can enjoy Thanksgiving in style at the lawnmower 5.0 ultra gobble, gobble boys. Now, listen, this is the present you want to give. Now you want to trim yourself up. Okay. In time for the Thanksgiving, nobody wants to show up to the dinner table with a big old hairy dick. Nobody. Now, when it comes time around for Christmas and you've already gifted your father, your father-in-law, your brother, your uncle. This is the ultimate gift for the guy for you to give because they're going to use it. They're going to thank you for it. Their spouse is really going to thank you for it. But this is the type of Thanksgiving holiday meal, dinner. You can conversation. You can have, how's that dick hair looking uncle Eric. Don't let your poor grooming be the topic of the dinner conversation this year. With the lawnmower 5.0 Ultra, you'll be the talk of the table. Show them that turkey leg. It's waterproof. You can groom it wet or dry. Let's face it. We want to look our best when we're carving that bird. You don't want to have a beautiful bird in a sad sack, literally. Plus, the LED spotlight ensures you don't miss a spot, even in low light situations. 
and I have it on good authority. There's parts of Dave Silva that have never seen the light. Speaking of carving, <laughs> the dual skin safe blade heads are your best two tag team partners. The trimmer blade takes care of business. The foil blade gives you that irresistibly sleek finish. Think of them as like the midnight express of your ball hair, like a winning <laughs> touchdown at the Thanksgiving table. By the way, everybody goes back for seconds on Thanksgiving and your spouse will be too. Thanks to this performance package 5.0 ultra. You've also got the lawnmower 5.0 ultra in the package. And how about the weed whacker 2.0 ear and nose hair trimmer, all the liquid formulations plus two free gifts. Seriously, you're going to smell like royalty with the crop soother aftershave lotion, the crop preserver, anti-chafe ball deodorant. Everybody needs those jingle balls. Come on now. The gift of manscape doesn't stop there. The free gifts, man, the underwear and the shed 2.0 toiletry bag. Jr. seriously, if you find him at an AW show, ask him about his shed travel bag. He's got his deodorant in there. He's got his aftershave in there. He's got his vape pen and I've said too much. Uh, listen, <laughs> get 20% off and free shipping with the code 83 weeks at manscape.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscape.com. Be sure to use our code 83 weeks. Be thankful this holiday season for the best gift of all from manscaped your balls. Well, thank you. Those are I, I, those. Every time you go into a manscape ad, I just <laughs> listen. We and get by to the way, I love the headlight on on the lawnmower. Yeah, that headlight is so cool. I just dig it, and that thing is powerful. How's your dick hair? Pretty sleek, brother. That's Pretty what I like sleek. to hear. That's what I like to hear. Uh, so listen, our topic today is not Tony Khan. It's not Billy Corgan. It's not even Vince McMahon. It's Ted Turner. Ted Turner is an icon of business. And if you're not necessarily a, uh, a type of person who reads books about business, and I happen to be one of those, unfortunately, you might not know a lot about Ted. We're going to do our best to drop some knowledge on you. I know everybody listening to this knows about his wrestling life. And we're going to talk about that too. But when I say, I mean, having read about him, worked with him around him, been in his a part of his empire once upon a time, when I say Ted Turner to you, what do you immediately think of? Like if we were doing word association with Ted Turner, what would you think of? Entrepreneur. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's at the core of who Ted Turner is. We, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about his journey here. He begins in his family business, Turner advertising. His father commits suicide in March of 1963. And Ted starts to turn that firm into a global enterprise. That sound familiar. Vince McMahon taking over. That's for what his I mean, dad. man. The parallels, if you just think about them, the, the parallels are pretty amazing. And you know, Turner advertising was essentially a billboard company. Yes. That's, that's what it was. They weren't selling advertising in the television industry or things like that. They were a billboard outdoor advertising company. Do you know, uh, have you ever heard, or, I mean, this is what I heard when I ask you, do you know what like Ted's big innovation was in the billboard business? I do not. So, and, and, and these days, of course, we've all seen a digital billboard. That's pretty common now, but that wasn't always the case. So think about it like on some level, if you just strip away everything, you know, about what we're talking about right now, if you're going to sell a billboard, like if you had to describe that to someone, it would be, it's a, it's space. You're selling space on the side of a road. So think of it. If it was a magazine, you're selling space in a magazine, right? Or for your television show, you're selling space inside a program or well, for a billboard. It's just a couple of a pole or two and. There's this giant sign and you're just selling space on the side of the road. Well, the trouble is in order to make more money, you have to charge more money for that billboard, which is hard to do. Go up on your customer's pricing, but you can do it incrementally, or you've got to go get more land leases or buy more land and build more billboards. That's kind of cost prohibitive. Then you got to negotiate with a bunch of different people, work out all these different terms, or what if you could sell the same billboard over and over and over and over and over at the same time. So back in the day, there was the billboards that turned Eric. So it would say one thing and then it, the billboard would turn. So individual mm -hmm. slats on the billboard would spin. That's a Ted Turner innovation. 
I did not know that. So you could sell that. You set up, you set up one billboard that could spin a few times and show a few different things. This is long before you could do digital billboards. Well, that's how Ted Turner was able to scale and get so much market share and, and build so much wealth. All of his competitors were selling just one picture of a billboard. He's able to sell multiple advertisers, the exact same board at the exact same time. So that sort of innovation is what helped propel Ted Turner's success. And he decides, let's take what we've been doing with, with advertising and let's start buying radio stations in the South. Now, of course he's in the South and he's going to start to buy radio stations in his neck of the woods, because again, it's one thing to sell the advertising. It's another thing to own the air, to own the billboards. So he's just continuing to expand. And, uh, the book that we referenced, it ain't as easy as it looks. Um, long before he starts to build this television empire and gathering up the rights to things like the Atlanta Braves and the Atlanta Hawks, we know who would eventually purchase those teams, but he starts by, I got to get those rights, but to see that that's the long-term play when he starts with billboards and then radio stations and then television stations, and then the rights to air the teams and then own the teams. I mean, this is, I hate to use buzzwords like this. And you and I both hate this word. We've said it to each other independently. You want to talk about vertical integration. Ted Turner was doing that shit way back when, right? He invented it. He did. He invented it. And you know, you're right. I mean, he bought uh channel 17. I think it was WTCG in 1970 is when he purchased a uh, little UHF station, purchased the Braves, I believe in 76, the Hawks shortly thereafter launched CNN, the first 24 hour worldwide cable news outlet. I mean, when people say someone is a visionary, you know, there are degrees, there are levels. I think Ted Turner in his era was he was the Elon Musk yes. of his era. He really, really was. And when you think about the impact that Ted Turner had on cable television in general, I know I'm digging a little bit here. <clears throat> I'm getting a little weedy. Do it. But if you look at the financials of all the major networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox. If you look at their financials, they are primarily, especially NBC, CBS, and ABC, primarily being kept afloat because of the profitability of their news divisions. Right. A lot of the other areas of those networks are hemorrhaging cash. They're only being kept afloat because of the strength of their news divisions. And by the way, their news divisions are only really capable of growing and sustaining because of the cable news, not because of network news at night. Cable news is the most profitable part. I believe don't quote me on this, but I'm pretty certain when I say cable news is the financial bedrock of the major networks, that wouldn't be true. Were it not for Ted Turner in 1980, when he created 20, when he created CNN, because as soon as he created CNN, Rupert Murdoch was right on his ass, which is why I had to go and ask for permission from Ted to do business with Fox because it was such a competitive situation between Rupert and Ted at that time. And they were, you know, bad mouthing each other in the press and taking shots at each other and all kinds of shit. It was a little bit like me and Vince um, back in the early nineties or mid nineties. But if you imagine what the world would look like right now, if 24 hour cable news didn't exist because networks probably wouldn't exist. I mean, so many things changed because of Ted Turner and the footprint and the legacy that he's created. And I don't, I don't know other than Elon Musk, if you can point to another contemporary visionary today that is on the same level as Ted Turner. I mean, I know we're going to be skipping around here, but let's just talk about what you what you said there. Cause I agree with you, but I don't know that I ever would have 
thought to compare him and Elon. And I realize Elon's polarizing these days for a variety of reasons, but digital billboards. Well, Ted was doing that first cable TV. Ted was doing that first 24 hour news stations. Ted was doing that first owning multiple teams. Not a lot of people owned multiple teams in, in different sports. Uh, Ted was doing that. I mean, he got ahead of so much. And even like these days, you look at the success of a streaming network, like a Netflix and all the investments they make in, in securing the rights to movies and things and production. Ted was doing movies for TV. Ted was going back and, and buying the classics and colorizing. He saw value in owning those movies. The whole television rights thing in large part is because of Ted Turner. I mean, cable TV is a thing because of Ted Turner. And so when we, as wrestling fans, think about Ted Turner, we think about, oh, and then he bought Jim Crockett promotions. I am literally yeah. the world's biggest fucking Jim Crockett promotions. Mark, I have a set recreated in my warehouse right now for Ric Flair's last match. Like it's a, it was a love letter to my childhood and pro wrestling. I absolutely loved it. However, CNN cable, TBS, the Braves, the Hawks in the scheme of things, Crockett promotions probably wouldn't make top 10 of the conversation of Ted Turner, but that's what we know him for. And we've also known that he was a maverick. This was the type of guy who allegedly Eric wore cowboy boots and suits, right? He did. You know, one of the, there's certain things that I remember about Ted. And I want to be really clear. I didn't have like Ted and I didn't hang out obviously, but I didn't even have a direct relationship or direct report to Ted. I reported either to Bill Shaw who reported to Ted or I reported to Harvey Schiller who reported to Ted. Um, I interfaced with Ted you know, famously about Nitro. The rest of the time it was phone calls that I got usually on Tuesday afternoons, congratulating me, listening to him laugh, talking about the ratings. Um, and then I would see him at company events a couple of times a year. I did. I, I did get invited to a couple of Christmas parties at Terry McGurk's house, very small, uh, m modest home for president of TBS and, you know, would see Ted there along with other executives, but I didn't have much interface with Ted at all, but yeah, you talk about an entrepreneur and a visionary. I don't know where we left off or what led me into making that comment, but fascinating, fascinating individual. I, people always say, you know, what was it like to work for Ted Turner? My response is always the same. If Ted called me on the phone right now and said, Eric, I'll make you a deal. If you cut off two fingers off your left hand, I got a gig for you. I'd, I'd do it myself. I mean, he was such a so much fun to work for. And again, not because I had so much interaction with him, but Ted set the tone in Turner Broadcasting. Ted was an entrepreneur's entrepreneur. One of the first pictures that Dave Silva put up there um, had a little plaque in front of it. It said, lead follower, get out of the way. A lot of people have that poster or plaque or whatever, you know, in their office. Ted lived by it. Ted lived by it. As long as you were trying, as long as you had a vision, as long as you were doing something different than everybody else was doing, you'd get a lot of rope in Turner Broadcasting. Ted, Ted really supported entrepreneurs and visionaries. And it wasn't so much so that you would be successful or unsuccessful as it was how, how, how much you were thinking outside of the box, how much of an entrepreneur you were. And Ted rewarded entrepreneurs. If he didn't, WCW would have never lasted two years. It would have never lasted two years because immediately there were executives in Turner Broadcasting that wanted to pull the plug on WCW. I've talked about that a million times. So has other people, I'm sure. But it was true. Ted stuck with it. And, and he let WCW fail any number of times before I took over and bounce off the bottom many number of times before I took over and he stuck with it because he had a vision for it. And man, to be able to work for somebody like that, that record that rewards risk-taking as opposed to, I think in most corporate environments today, everybody is so risk adverse that you're walking on eggshells constantly. 
it's, it's business wise. It's just a different world today than it was when Ted was running Turner Broadcasting, you know, pre AOL Time Warner merger, because then it became something completely different. What I appreciated most about Ted is the idea that he, uh, he had no problem facing adversity or a challenge. He liked to compete. He didn't run from it. There's that famous story where he closes on the acquisition of Jim Crockett promotions. And of course, Jim Crockett had been the last remaining territory, if you will, the last rival to Vince McMahon's WWF. And you know, the eighties were, were certainly all about Vince McMahon and his expansion, but try as they might, the Crockett's tried to keep up with Starcade in 83. And then they can, they started to spin off other pay-per-views, you know, once the pay-per-view era came around and tried to compete with WrestleMania and they would try to do some licensing deals and things like that. But eventually Vince McMahon and his new approach and his, uh, I mean, he was not risk averse. Let's just say that eventually, uh, they just outmanned and outmaneuvered Crockett promotions. And it had been such a big part of Ted's presentation and his lineup on TBS going back to the Georgia championship wrestling days. I mean, once upon a time, he had three different shows on the air, three different wrestling shows on TBS. And famously, you know, he even had Vince's show, the whole black Saturday thing. So he's familiar with Vince knows Vince. And as the rumor and innuendo goes, Eric, he picks up the phone and calls Vince McMahon and says something like Vince. I just want to let you know I'm in the wrestling business. And of course, Vince, as the story goes, allegedly says, well, we're in the sports entertainment business. What do you, did you, had you heard that story before? Or is that just a piece of wrestling lore that Ted just picked up the phone and called Vince? I I've heard the story before. I don't know if it's true or not. I like to believe it is because it sounds like something Ted would do. It does. I mean, he was, you know, they call him the mouth of the South, you know, all due respect to Jimmy Hart Um, or captain outrageous. You know, let's not forget. He was a, uh, a world-class yachtsman that loved to compete in whatever the biggest boat race in the world was once a year. Um, Look at that. I mean, if you're watching us on YouTube here, following with us, you know, just a wall full of trophies as a sailor, a competitive sailor. And that's a, that's a great, I saw a documentary once on a, years and years and years ago about Ted and competing. And uh, it's, it's a crazy sport, by the way, you're not just out there floating around with a couple hot chicks on the boat, catching rays, man. It's a, it's a very dangerous sport, but and Ted was obsessed with it. Um, won the America's cup as a result, the story's talking about him being so drunk. He couldn't do an interview. <laughs> he, he was celebrating so much and got hammered and they had to wake him up to try to try to get an interview out of him. And, and he did it, you know, and he was criticized largely because of reason, because of it, because, you know, that's, you know, yachting is a very, you know, it's like golf. You don't just don't do that stuff. That didn't give a shit. He's an amazing guy. But I believe that's true. I believe that's true. You know, I didn't hear a lot about the interaction between Vince and Ted until, I don't know, maybe a couple of years ago. You know, I, I, I didn't even realize the history between WWE or WWF at the time and Turner prior to me become prior to me getting there. I wasn't even aware of that until recently. Oh, wow. It's kind of fascinating. Hmm. Well, something I wasn't aware of that you smartened me up to is something you're using in your everyday life. Why don't you hold your phone up to the camera? Show everybody what you got on your phone. There. Oh, this is real folks. That right there is a spider grip. Spider grip keeps your phone on your hand where it belongs. It's the phone grip that won't slip. Spider grip props up as a stand rotates 360 degrees and lays flat locked in place easily. Fitting into your pockets or your purse, Spider Grip is comfortable, durable, and functional, and it appeals to anyone who has a phone. No more unfortunate drops in all the wrong places. No more missed opportunities on great pictures and video. No more hand pain due to balancing your phone with your pinky finger. Why? Well, because Spider Grips allow you to hold your phone in the most natural and comfortable way. As unique and exciting as Spider Grip is, 
their team is as well. Co-founded and invented by recording on art artist and entrepreneur, David Britt. Spider grip is also co-founded and co-owned by actress and producer Kate Bosworth, along with Mr. Worldwide himself, Grammy award-winning artist Pitbull. Spider grip has been featured on live national television as the first ever presenter on America's big deal, which aired on the USA network spider grips inventor, David Britt, along with a special guest of pro wrestling duo, the Swant, the Dawson's rather pitched the product to the American public and sold out in two minutes and 30 seconds. It's also been on HSN spider grip is the best phone grip around. It's made right here in the USA. It's headquartered in Charlotte, North Kakalaki which is the old stomping grounds. And of course the glory days of Jim Crockett promotions. Spider grip is also used by several pro wrestling stars today, including Eric Bischoff. Get yours today at spidergrip.com. That's spidergrip.com. There's two eyes in spider and two eyes in grip. I'll spell it for you. It's S P I I D E R G R I I P.com. That's spidergrip.com. Use our code 83 weeks at checkout. You get 30% off and free shipping. Grip the freedom. Eric, my wife loves hers. Uh, she finds it comes in handy when she's at the gym. We saw you do a live demonstration here. Clearly you love yours too. I do. It's one of the, you know, it's every so often, you know, we get products to try before we promote them. And, you know, sometimes I get stuff and I look at it, I don't know if I'd ever use that. So I threw this on my phone and I haven't taken it off since it does, you know, I, you and I talked before the air. I don't carry a wallet because I don't like having things in my pocket. I don't like bulk and weight in my pocket. I like to be sleek, aerodynamic. And I thought, man, if I put this thing on my phone, it's going to be too hard or uncomfortable to get in and out of my pocket. Wrong. It's easy. And the thing I love, again, because you know how many phones I've dropped? You know how many screens I've shattered? I don't even have a case on my phone. There's no case here. I don't need it because I don't drop my shit anymore. It stays right here. I walk around with it. It's on my hand. It looks like it's connected to my to my body. It's awesome. My wife hates it because my phone is always <laughs> in my hand. She freaking hates it. Are you ever going to put your phone down? Would you look at me in the eyes when you talk to me, please? We're eating dinner and you're eating dinner with your right hand and looking at your phone on your left. Stop it. But it's hard to put it down because it's just so comfortable. Look at that. I can do anything. Who stays with me? Throw it like a frisbee. Nope. Won't go anywhere. Sticks with you. Love it. Spidergrip.com. There's two eyes in spider. There's two eyes in grip and you'll get a big chunk of savings when you use our promo code 83 weeks. Uh, so listen, we know that Ted is going to go ahead and purchase Jim Crockett promotions. That happens in late 1988. Um, and then there's the big phone call that happens now, technically the AWA is still hanging around. So Vern Gagne is still there and uh, in the rumor and innuendo is that Ted Turner paid 9 million bucks for Jim Crockett promotions. That's a pretty landmark deal. You see this uh, article that was in one of the after mags. You see Jim Crockett on the right, who unfortunately is no longer with us going left. There's Jim Hurd, there's Jack Petrick. And then on the left, the man, Ted Turner. And of course he didn't technically buy the NWA, but that is the way it was positioned because for all intents and purposes, Jim Crockett promotions was the NWA. It's still a territory, but you know, they were promoting the NWA world champion and all their shows would be presented as if they were part of the NWA, but he didn't technically buy the NWA, but that is a fun. What if type scenario? to think what if he would have bought the actual NWA and not Jim Crockett promotions, because technically that would now be owned by Vince McMahon. Isn't that crazy to think about? It is, you know, one little, and and, and how easily could that have happened? Very easy. I mean, it's, I'm surprised that it didn't. That's how easily it could have happened. I'm shocked that it didn't frankly, because Jim Crockett promotions wasn't really a brand and NWA was right. And, and Ted obviously was smart enough to recognize that. So there must've been a reason for it. And I think rocket promotions was in bankruptcy and Ted bought them out of bankruptcy. So that $9 million I'm guessing went to pay off a lot of debt. No, they didn't actually file bankruptcy. He saved them they from didn't. bankruptcy. Yeah. Okay. Well then either case that yeah. $9 million probably went to pay off a lot of debt. Um, 
that had been acquired by Jim Crockett Promotions. But I how think, easily I think there was that hurt feelings there too. To huh? I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I think there were hurt feelings there. I get the vibe I mean, in talking to David Crockett that Jim cut a deal, and David did not want to do this deal. And I guess their mother sort of intervened and said, Hey, this is what we got to do. And Jim was honest when we interviewed him years ago. And he said that he had been drinking too much and he had some marital trouble and he had moved out to Texas and he didn't want to be around Charlotte anymore. He needed to get out of Charlotte. He didn't even want to show his face there. So he's clearly going through a tough patch. And now some of these, to your point, there are some bills that are mounting up. But allegedly Jim made the deal and I guess there's some hurt feelings and maybe as I understand it, reading between the lines, some of the family doesn't speak well with each other or interface much at all. Like for an extended period of time, based on the way this distribution went down, the, the impression I got is that perhaps Jimmy looked out for himself first and everybody else kind of got the leftovers. That's the vibe. Nobody's ever told me that, but that's the vibe I get. Um, it's just a shame because so many people identify so fondly great memories with that promotion and for it to go down like this is a shame, but I'm glad that, you know, it lived on and we got Ted Turner in the race one way or another. We did. He jumped in with both feet, you know, eight years after CNN became a thing, um, Ted Turner acquires. Crockett promotions. However, he did it. He acquired it and changed the name to WCW and off we go. And that's so amazing too, because you hear the stories about what WWE paid for WCW and it was even less than what Ted Turner paid the Crockett's in, in 1988 and Dave Meltzer, your great close personal friend. Uh, he went out of his way a few years ago when talking about the observer wrestling hall of fame, which by the way, I got a ballot for, and I voted once again. Uh, he wrote, Hey, it's great stuff. Come on now. He wrote quote, Turner spent little time in his life thinking about wrestling and never worked directly in wrestling yet in the United States wrestling business over the last 50 years, very few have been more important. That's pretty, pretty well said by Dave. No, go on. That's it. That's the whole quote. Oh. That's a compliment. That's That's a good thing. No, it's true. What he said was true. It happens occasionally, but it's true. That's what I wanted to ask you because I feel like we've seen, and we've talked about it earlier today. You know, I I referenced Dixie Carter and we referenced Billy Corgan. And now these days we know we've got Tony Khan. We've got these independently wealthy, successful people who, who like wrestling and can identify the opportunity of the wrestling business and say, you know what? I think I want to try my hand at that business. And then they go forth and they do. I think the difference in Ted Turner and almost all those other folks is Ted Turner was sort of hands off in the wrestling business comparatively compared to a Dixie or a Billy or a Tony. Would you agree with that? Not even comparatively. He had, well, in my experience, at least almost no direct connect, probably had more direct connect with me than he did with anybody that preceded me with the exception of maybe Jack Petrick and, and Jim Hurd initially. Do you think that's because of his success as an entrepreneur, he had gotten comfortable with and understood that in order to really scale a business, whether you're trying to grow, you know, up or out or in whatever direction you're going to have to delegate. So he was just more inclined to be hands off. He had to be Ted didn't. I mean, if you, if you look at just everything that Ted accomplished between 1980 with the debut of CNN Forget about everything that happened. But by the way, he created the first superstation. You know, that was another first. You know, the Chicago WGN uh, became a superstation shortly thereafter. But Bill, or excuse me, Ted uh, pretty much created the model and the methodology. But if you look at, you know, he owned New Line, he owned Castle Rock, he owned Hanna Barbera, he, you know, he, the acquisition of the MGM Phil, Film Library, the creation of all the various networks, Cartoon Network, for example all the various networks that are now under the, or were under the brand of Turner broadcasting now Warner brothers discovery. Um, Ted didn't have time to manage a wrestling business. Ted didn't have time to manage a lot of the businesses that, that he built so 
rapidly. You're not talking about a hundred years of growth here. You're talking about 20. If you look at where Turner Broadcasting was in 1980, premier of CNN, to 2000, within a 20 year period, he built a media empire. He certainly wasn't going to have time to run any individual business of it. Now he was more interested in the Braves than he was in probably some of the other businesses because of his affection for the team and in baseball in general. Um, I think he may have gotten a little bit more involved in, in the Braves from an operational point of view. In fact, I think he actually played in a game at one point. I remember hearing a story where this is when nobody was watching the Braves and he decided he was going to create some kind of a stunt. And he, I think he ran some bases or something crazy, but I mean, that was Ted, you know, Ted was crazy, much like Vince McMahon was crazy. I had a little touch of crazy now and then myself. There's not comparing me to either Vince or Ted, but right, there's, right, a, right. there's a common theme there where you're just not afraid to put yourself out there and do crazy shit to get the right attention. And maybe that's being an entrepreneur. I don't know. But you look at everything that Ted accomplished in that 20 year window, which is a minute, it's like 64 seconds in real life. Yeah. He didn't have time to operate anything. I mean, maybe things would have been different had he, but he Ted wanted, even when I was there early, when I was there before I got into management, it was discussed and kind of well-known. It was no secret. Ted wanted, he was trying to buy CBS. He wanted to buy a legacy network. He wanted to buy NBC. I believe he took a run at it once or twice. And failed, which is one of the reasons why when the AOL Time Warner thing came along and it looked to Ted at that at that moment in that snapshot, it looked like this was his opportunity to own a media empire that eclipsed NBC or, or CBS. Um, that's why Ted was so motivated and why he gave up so much, including his own position in the company. Um, but no, Ted, Ted had very very, very minimal contact with WCW, very minimal contact. Well, it's been said over and over and over that Ted was all for buying WCW, but perhaps a lot of the Turner brass was not Dave Meltzer would write this in the observer. There were times between 89 and 94 when the Turner executives would note the wrestling losses and want to close down the company at one such meeting where basically every one of the execs underneath we in agreement to shut down the wrestling part of the company due to the losses. Ted Turner at a meeting pointed out that wrestling has been a key part of TBS had helped build the station and that wrestling was a cyclical business and no one is to ever bring up shutting down WCW ever again. Do you remember? Can, I, can I jump in there? Please do. And interrupt. First of all, you know, good, good point by Dave rare, but good. It true. Very true. But going back to CW. You know, Ted, Ted, when he launched the, the Superstation and was in desperate need of advertisers, but he didn't have a big budget. He couldn't go out and buy first-run syndication or first-run movies or forget about originals. He just didn't have the budget. So Ted's budget was Andy Mayberry, you know, the Braves, obviously, uh, professional wrestling. A lot of the older reruns, classic television before classic television became a thing, in addition to wrestling. Ted believed, and I think I read this in Porter Bibb's book. That's why I was desperate. I wanted to get a copy of it downloaded before I did this. But if I remember correctly in reading that book, Ted believed that while professional wrestling certainly didn't maintain the advertising revenue of some of the other programs he would have preferred to have and program on his network. It had a large and loyal and consistent audience. And Ted believed that by having professional wrestling, even if it lost money by attracting those eyeballs to the network, it would allow him to promote some of his other programming that did get better CPMs or cost per thousands. Why do I bring that up in the context of CW? If I'm, like I said earlier, if I'm Nick Khan and I'm looking at C CW and going, you know what? They're making moves. They made a move with Live Golf. On its own, not very significant. 
but they keep making these moves to suggest that they want to build a viable network platform. And they're at the bottom. They've got nowhere to go but up. NXT already delivers ratings that exceed the highest rated programs in primetime on CW, but they've got a younger demo. It makes perfectly good sense for Nick Khan to look at this opportunity, especially with NXT, because it's not one of the top two brands, to position it in a network. The network, it makes sense because they're going to use NXT and WWE to help build their audience so they can promote into other forms of entertainment, other other programming, much the same as Ted Turner looked at WCW or Crockett Promotions back in 1988. Let's, yeah, it doesn't get great ratings. It, the advertising is hard to sell, but we're bringing bodies to the dance. And if long as we, the more bodies we get to the dance, the more music we'll be able to, to, to provide the, the, the higher value that we'll have as a network. It's very interesting how this move to CW all these years later has a lot of the same tones and some of the same tenor is that, that Ted Turner believed in terms of what wrestling could bring to the network way back when. Well said, Eric, when did you first meet Ted Turner. Is this when you were the C level announcer? Do you remember when you first met him? Yeah, I think so. You know, uh, Turner, you know, Christmas day event or holiday event of some kind, me and, you know, 3,500 other of my closest friends, you know, would be there. We'd see him on stage and Ted would, you know, he would mingle. He'd walk through, he'd shake hands and say, hi. I think he came over to WCW once or twice when I was an announcer and mingled and took pictures of some of the talent and, things like that. So he, Ted Turner actually came to a, uh, an episode. Uh, he brought Jane <laughs> with him actually. Uh, yeah, this was late. This is under my watch. Um, not sure when that would have been. Leon was still there. Probably 95. We're looking at a yeah. photo. Uh, if you're not watching along with us on YouTube, when Eric just started saying this is, he's referencing a photo that's up on YouTube right now. You can watch along. With yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. It was probably 93, 94 is my guess, but Ted would come in and you know, he, and he was so down to earth. He's just, you wouldn't imagine you were talking to somebody of his stature in the business world and media in particular at that point in time, he's just very, very down to earth. When I first got to, to Turner, uh, Bill Shaw told me that, uh, Right after I first got there, you know, Ted, Ted would come to work. He drove a Ford Taurus. He drove a Ford Taurus this guys worth billions of dollars. He drove a Ford Taurus, drove himself to work. Didn't have a chauffeur. He drove, you know, I remember it was blue. I mean, one time I parked my Harley, I drove my Harley to work and I had a parking space at, up on the executive level of the Turner parking deck. I pulled my Harley in and it was a chopper too. It wasn't just a, you know, regular Harley. I pulled in and, you know, I'm four parking spaces down from Ted Turner that particular day. And there's Ted's Taurus. <laughs> it was kind of funny. It is pretty funny. I didn't know that he drove a four Taurus. That's a very yeah. uh, Warren Buffett like, um, very much so. Bill Watts, of course, is going to be a predecessor before you really take over things. He's, uh, going to be, uh, running things for WCW. We know that he does an interview and has some comments about Hank Aaron and or some comments that don't make Hank Aaron very happy. Uh, so, uh, we know that, that that's the end of Bill Watts and WCW. I kind of feel like the hard charging tough nose thing could have worked for Ted. Ultimately, we know it didn't work out long-term for Bill. What can you tell us about your interaction with Ted as far as once you get the big seat and were there expectations good or bad that he placed upon you? You know, I didn't really have any, uh, you know, I was Bill Shaw made me the executive producer and whatever it was, 1993, um, 94, I brought Hogan in and I, I didn't even communicate with Ted about that. I kind of brokered that deal or Bill Shaw brokered that deal between Ted and WCW. So I didn't even interface with, with, uh, Ted at all during the Hogan acquisition. It really wasn't in terms of one-on-one -on -one, again, I saw him at events and functions, but I didn't really have any one-on-one -on -one conversations at all with Ted until the day I went into his office to present the opportunity to do international distribution 
through one of Rupert Murdoch's companies called Star TV in Asia. It was owned by Murdoch. So I had to go to Ted to get permission to do the deal. Even though that deal, because we were so close to being profitable at that time, that deal would have, based on the financials we currently had and what our projections that were very sound projections were going to be, that deal with Rupert Murdoch would have definitely put WCW in the black by a wide margin. But I couldn't do the deal because I it was Rupert Murdoch. So I had to go talk to Ted. So my very first interaction was to pitch him something that I should have been afraid to pitch him, to be honest, because Ted hated Rupert at that time. They're, they're cool now. But at that time, he was like, I, if Vince, if Ted Turner was Vince McMahon, Rupert Murdoch was Eric Bischoff in 1996. That's, that's where that relationship was. And I'm going in there going, oh, hey, I got an idea, Ted. Let's do some business with Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> Silly, but it worked, I guess. Talk to me about Jim Barnett. It's been said over the years that he had a relationship that would even predate yours with Ted Turner. Did you ever hear about that? Yep. 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 I I could never put a finger on it. You know, Jim, Jim was a great storyteller. Um, and I never dug into it, you know, to try to find out what was true, wasn't true, but here's what I do know, you know, Jim Crock, or excuse me. Um, Jim came over with, Jim was a part of the Jack Petrick, Jim Hurd, original configuration. Jim Barnett was right there, central to it. I think Jim Barnett kind of acted as a consultant with Ted, perhaps pre-acquisition of Crockett Promotions. So Jim was there, but he was never in a defined role. It's like... Ted went, all right, Jim, help me put this deal together. He's getting on. I'm going to give him a job, make him comfortable. Not going to require too much of him. He's just going to be there as a resource. That's really what Jim Barnett was, I think, for the longest time. And Jim Barnett was really good at playing that. Like, because Jim Bar- Barnett loved, Barnett and Gary Jester both. They were cut out of the same cloth in that respect. They just love the political corporate intrigue. And there was a lot of it to love back then. It was a mess, to be honest. But Jim was, all, everybody, you know, when Bill Watts came in, he had his opinions about Jim Barnett and his value to WCW, but he didn't cross him. Right. Because you never knew where Jim's, re, re, you know, relationships were with regard to Ted. So Jim was able to exist in this little world all of his own. And just watch everybody play their roles in this big stage play called WCW for a couple of years, several years. Randy Booth was interviewed for Guy Evans' fabulous book, The Rise and Fall. You got to go check that out. We've pushed it and promoted it a lot here. We love Guy's book. I think you will too. But he's reporting uh, in the book here that Randy Booth is going to tell everybody that they've received an offer to purchase WCW. And at the time, as we mentioned, a lot of the Turner brass thought it was, uh, that the pro wrestling outfit was a quote, notoriously inept money loser. And that WCW had never made a single profit when they're talking about this meeting here in may of 95. So from when they first purchased the thing seven years ago in 1988, they've yet to turn a profit and Scott Sasa is going to leap to his feet, high-fiving Terry McGurk. Everybody's fired up. Hey, we got an offer. And Ted, according to the Randy Booth interview, here's you've now got wrestling. And then Ted stops him and says, you've now got wrestling on TNT in prime time. And the big celebration amongst the Turner brass pauses in disbelief. And this is an exact contradiction to what they wanted. They wanted to unask the thing, not put it in prime time. Now you've told the famous story many times here on the program about how nitro was really born. Do you think Randy Booth is just combining both of these stories, two separate meetings and turning it into one story accidentally? I don't know. I mean, there's, there are a number of things that I read in, in guy's book that surprised me that, you know, 
with regard to executives, mm-hmm. or, you know, far above me on the Turner corporate food chain that had impact, made decisions, or had influence on WCW that I didn't even I never even knew about even while I was there. So I guess, I guess you know, if you want to, here's what I do know. I know that I worked on a presentation to go pitch Ted for probably two weeks before I actually had my meeting with Ted. I briefed Harvey Schiller on it. Schiller would have input on my presentation. Schiller understood it. Schiller supported it because it would have turned WCW into a profit center earlier than it eventually became. Um, Schiller never mentioned once to me that there was a, there was in Ted's mind, he saw a home for Nitro, saw a home for WCW on TNT. In the 10 days or two weeks of me working on this proposal and interfacing with Schiller in preparation for because Schiller had to know what I was pitching. He was my boss. He didn't want to sit in front of Ted and have Ted ask Schiller a question that Ted didn't know the answer to. So I, or that Harvey didn't know the answer to. So I had to brief Harvey on every aspect of it. And we ran it through legal. We ran it through financial. You know, we had it analyzed. It wasn't just me going, hey, boss, I got an idea. It was a very well vetted opportunity that I never got more than two minutes into. So perhaps Ted had already made up his mind per Randy Booth in advance of my meeting with him. There was just no indication of it to me, certainly, and not to Harvey Schiller. And Scott Sassa acted a little shocked. Sassa was in the room right next to Harvey. I'm I'm center. I'm right across from Ted. Harvey's to my right. Sassa's to his right in kind of a semicircle within four feet of each other. And I'm pretty good read of people. I don't think Sasa saw that one coming. The first thing Sasa said, he said, well, Brad Siegel's not here. What, shouldn't we wait till Brad gets here? And Ted said, he's a smart guy. He'll figure it out. That was the end of that conversation. You know, because normally the head of a network would be in a meeting where a decision is made, of something of that significance. You don't want the head of the network to show up and go get a memo. You know, oh, by the way, in your absence, we reprogrammed your prime time. <laughs> that's not usually how that stuff goes. That's how that went. So I don't know, man. Maybe Randy Booth is conflating two things, or maybe maybe Ted had made the decision and didn't really give a shit what I wanted to talk about, was just brought me to his office to tell me to go do a show for TNT. I, anything's possible. I don't know. Well, we know it was a huge celebration afterwards, and I only wish I could go back in time and hand you a bottle of Z-Biotics because I know you went right down to Jocks and Jill's and you started chug-a-lugging to celebrate. We've all done that. But now as we get a little older, we start to say, man, is this worth it? I'm going to feel miserable the day after these drinks. Now you can do both thanks to a game-changing product that Eric and I really believe in called Z-Biotics. Z-Biotics Pre-Alcohol Probiotic is the world's first genetically engineered probiotic. It was invented by PhD scientists to tackle rough mornings after drinking. Here's how it works. When you drink, alcohol gets converted into a toxic byproduct in the gut. It's this byproduct, not dehydration, that's to blame for your rough next day. Zbiotics produces an enzyme to break this byproduct down. You see, it's designed to work like your liver, but in your gut where you need it most. So drink Zbiotics before drinking, drink responsibly, and then enjoy the night with confidence. So we've told this story before. Eric and I first tried this years ago when we were going to be speaking in podcast movement, but we wanted to uh, celebrate our success after a long day of meeting with agencies. So we met at the bar, bellied up, and Eric reaches into his bag and slides out Zbiotics. We closed the bar down that night, and we were bright-eyed and bushy-tailed on stage the next day. First thing in the morning, like nothing happened, Zbiotics made it possible. We're real believers in it. I have to admit, I was skeptical at first, but now I've tried it. And before I'm doing my vodka waters, I'm darn sure doing a little Zbiotics. And I think you should do it too, especially right here around the holidays. You're going to have people over for Thanksgiving or Christmas and your friends, your family, they will thank you. Savor the moment. Let Zbiotics do the rest. Go to zbiotics.com slash 83 weeks. Get 15% off your first order. When you use 83 weeks at checkout, Zbiotics is backed with a hundred percent money back guarantee. So if you're unsatisfied for any reason, a refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, head right now to zbiotics.com slash 83 weeks. 
Use the code 83 weeks at checkout. You'll get 15% off. We thank Zbiotics for sponsoring this episode and a heck of a lot of good times. So listen, you, uh, you wrote in your book that you knew Ted valued content over dollars. He knew the long-term play was content. That's going to get you those long-term dollars. He saw this maybe before anybody else. And, uh, you even wrote this after that meeting where nitro was greenlit. The impression I have of Ted Turner is that he's a genius in a lot of ways and he's extremely competitive. He believed in WCW. And I think we had gained enough momentum that we were beginning to validate his beliefs. So when he started thinking about what it would take to get to the next level, going head to head with Vince was an obvious next step. I think he said to himself, we've built this product. We're ready to compete. Let's compete. I think it was really that simple, man. I like when sometimes we don't overthink things. Hey, if we've got a product that can be competitive, let's go compete. That works for me. And clearly it worked for WCW. Yeah. You know, and there's this narrative that all Eric Bischoff did was spend 10 Turner's money. Like Ted Turner just decided to, you know, pull a truck up and unload hundreds of millions of dollars into WCW that I could go and do anything I wanted to do with. And nothing was farther from the truth. You know, I, I won't go into a great deal of detail here, but to kind of contextualize it in this conversation, WCW, as we've covered here, had been losing money every year. Everybody expected it to lose money. When I got to WCW, one of the first things that someone said to me is, look, as long as <laughs> as long as this show is getting ratings, we've got jobs for lives. Just keep your head. Larry Zabisco, keep your head down. You get a check for the rest of your life. As long as we keep delivering an audience to TBS, which we were. But we were losing so much money in, in the process. Um, when I when Bill Shaw, and we've we've covered this, when when Bill Shaw basically came to WCW after uh Watts got let go, Bill Shaw said, This is it. Ted has made up his mind that unless we can turn this company around. Because you all know, Bill Shaw said, every executive in this company underneath Ted wants to pull the plug. Well, now Ted is ready to pull the plug unless this company can turn itself around. That was a hell of a statement. Fast forward, I get made executive producer, I become senior vice president, whatever. Along the way, we were under such tight financial constraints. We managed every nickel in that budget. I won't tell the pencil story again, but travel was something that I was really hyper-focused on because it became apparent to me when I was a C-Scott talent that nobody was afraid of, that there was a tremendous amount of fraud taking place within the travel area. Not so much by the people in Turner Broadcasting who were issuing travel, but by the, the talent had figured out a way to maximize an opportunity, and they did. It cost Turner probably millions of dollars a year in the long run. So we started hacking and slashing and finding every way we could to manage all of our expenses. One of the reasons that I had, you know, Paul Levesque tells the story where I, you know, Paul wanted, he lived up in Boston or somewhere up in the Northeast. And, you know, we were talking about him maybe coming down. I think Terry Taylor wanted to bring him in, you know, to WCW. Paul was fresh out of Killer Kowalski's wrestling school, but he lived in the upper, in Northeast. And I told Paul, you were geographically undesirable. As Paul Levesque told the story later on, much later on, I called him a gud geographically undesirable because I couldn't afford to transport him. And I said, if you want to move here, we would love to hire you, but I can't fly you back and forth from the East coast. Those days are over because that's what had been taking place. So I mean, we travel was the thing I focused on. Then it was production. When we made the move to Disney, <clears throat> as controversial as that was with wrestling fans, not controversial, they're just bitching and whining, wrestling fans, Dave Meltzer fans. I can't believe you shoot this wrestling show on a soundstage. Oh, it looks so phony. Oh, fake cheers, fake booze. They're not even a real wrestling audience. Every critique you could possibly find. But it worked on a business level because there was an economy of scale there with regard to our costs. Now, it wasn't significant. But it was. But more importantly, the show looked better. 
even though it wasn't a real audience, it sure looked better than putting on a show somewhere in some small town in Rome, Georgia with 300 people there and half of them got in for free and we had to turn the lights down and nobody really gave a shit anyway. Right. That's what we had been doing. So you move the show to Disney and all the wrestling fans and the internet, what became the internet wrestling community, hated the dirt sheet community hated it. It served several purposes. Again, economy of scale, save a little bit of money, made the show look better. All of a sudden we became a little bit more appealing to advertisers, which is the reason why when I went to Bill Shaw and said, Hey, I'm thinking about Hulk Hogan. What do you think? We got an idea of what the cost would be. Bill Shaw wouldn't pitch it to Ted. I didn't, but because WC, now this is the story that Bill Shaw told me, by the way, this isn't just my interpretation of things, but because of the incremental improvements that we had made in WCW in terms of managing expenses and improving the quality of the product at the same time, it gave Ted the confidence to your point to go, you know what? Let's see if a Hulk Hogan can do it for WCW. Had it had my WCW in 1994 been the same WCW in 1992 or 1993 in terms of its business and, and everything about it, Ted wouldn't have sprung for Hulk. We gave him confidence. We were at least moving in the right direction. We weren't profitable at that point, but we were heading in the right direction because of simple, basic, fundamental business operations, focusing on expenses. Once Hogan came in and all of a sudden different advertisers were now talking to Turner ad sales and they were making some, some progress and we had something we could actually market with. I got a little more money to work with. 95. I got Nitro to work with. But those were incremental moves that took place over a period of about two and a half or three years that nobody thinks about when they write about wrestling or WCW at that time. They just think I woke up one day and went, look at this. Ted dropped off $100 million. Aren't I a lucky son of a bitch? What can I go by? It was exactly the opposite of that. Ted was smart, though. And he, he was competitive and he did have a bigger vision for WCW than my predecessors had for it. Let's talk about the billionaire Ted skits. You know, when the Monday night wars start to really get cooking in 1996, uh, they start running huckster, nacho man and billionaire Ted skits. They pay it off before uh, WrestleMania 12 there in Anaheim in 96. Do you think clearly he knew about it? Do you think he ever oh, I saw- knew? Do you think he ever saw one? Anybody ever get him a tape of it? You know, I wasn't there. I'm trying to adjust my camera as we go here. Cause Dave just asked me to do it. It keeps popping up. Just have to struggle with it for this episode. Um, Bill Shaw took those, a couple of those skits to Ted to make him aware. I wasn't in the room, but Bill's always been straight up with me. And, uh, he basically said, Ted laughed his ass off. Thought it was hilarious. Yeah. I wasn't there. So I don't, I don't know. You would also write that, uh, during the 83 week streak, you'd hear from Ted, maybe like monthly. And he'd just sort of briefly congratulate you on how things were going. And sometimes you'd get those high five calls on a Tuesday afternoon when the ratings were coming in, any of those particular phone calls stand out that you want to share with us? Well, they all stand out because again, I didn't have that direct relationship with Ted. So for me to be sitting in my office on Tuesday afternoon, you know, essentially waiting for those numbers to come out. Um, and then 20 minutes after they come out, I'm getting a phone call and Janie Engel says, Eric, Ted Turner's on the line. That's kind of a big damn deal. Yeah, it is. Every one of them was a big damn deal to me. And it was Ted and Brad Siegel that were on the line. And the fun part was Ted was like a little kid. Ted was more excited than I was. And I was pretty excited. Ted was like a little kid. And I, and I think that's probably why I wrote in that book is that WCW validated Ted Turner's belief in WCW for years while everybody around Ted wanted to pull the plug on it. And Ted was steadfast and he said, no. And he said, why? And then here we are outperforming WWE and becoming profitable within a year and a half or two years of me getting in charge becoming in charge. It just was a fun time. And it happened. 
I don't want to say it happened every week. It happened almost every week. If I said in the book once a month, I don't know what I was thinking, but it, but it happened almost every week for the first six or eight months. It tapered off after that. It became kind of like more commonplace. Yeah. But for the first few months, it was like every every Tuesday afternoon was a surprise party. You know, <laughs> it was great. Talk to me about actually attending the events. How many do you recall off the top of your head? Like, was it a special occasion when he would come to a show? I mean, are you guys changing backstage? Like we got to roll out the red carpet. The big boss is coming or, or is there a moment no. or a big show you remember him attending? And you know, if there's something special that we wanted to promote or if, uh, if it was an event that was special, if we asked Ted and he was in town, he would come and it was really just all about his availability, but we didn't go to that. Well, very often I, again, I didn't go to the well, Bill Shaw would have gone to the well, especially with regard to, to Hulk, but that would have been easy. And we see, uh, if you're looking at it with us, there's looks like it's Brad C. No, that's Bill Shaw. Bill Shaw up over uh, Ric Flair's head. If you're watching with us along on YouTube or over at every shows, um, but we wouldn't go to that well very often. And it was Bill Shaw that would do it not me. So we know and that we didn't roll out the red carpet, by the way. I mean, that shot that you had up earlier with, with, uh, Ted and Jane, that was at center stage. Yeah. I mean, that was like the least cool venue in the history of venues. I yeah. mean, it was, and this was before it was remodeled and redone. It was, it was kind of grungy at the time, but no, nothing special for Ted. He didn't have any security. He just showed up him and Jane had fun. High fived everybody told us he loved us and left. <laughs> it was awesome. And clearly he had confidence in WCW and the expansion effort thunder, which we've talked about before. We know he's going to green light that. Green Another, light. That's not really the right word, but yeah, he's going to mandate <laughs> it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was a do it or else. Yeah. <laughs> Let's talk about something else you wrote that I've always been curious about. You wrote the Atlanta thrashers, which would have been the, uh, one of the first forays into hockey there in the Atlanta market for the NHL. You wrote that when they became part of this operation, it was really a, a low note for a lot of the staff. Why was that? For WCW staff. Well, just the Turner staff. I mean, were, were people not on board with hockey? Did they start to view that as maybe this is the new wrestling? Do you think? No, I, I don't know. You know, I'd have to go back and read exactly what I, what I wrote or the context in which I wrote it in. But I think the thrashers were a definite, a definite downer for WCW because it took all of Harvey Schiller's focus. I see. Okay. That makes it, sense. Schiller was very interested, very supportive, had a lot of time for WCW. Once the thrashers became, it's one of the reasons WCW got moved out of the CNN center, which was, I didn't realize it at the time, but a pretty demoralizing move. Here we are enjoying phenomenal success. Prove Ted, right? We're really one of the success stories of Turner broadcasting not in terms of scale, but in terms of success and turnaround and the amount of mainstream publicity we were getting and prestige that all of a sudden the company had, this was a company that, you know, in 1992, 1993, even 1994, any Turner executive that wanted to progress in Turner broadcasting stayed as far away from anything that had a WCW logo on it as possible. They just looked down their nose at it. You know, we, we all felt like, you know, <laughs> the, the redheaded stepchildren of Turner broadcasting, you know, they acknowledge us, but didn't want us to come to the family dinner kind of thing. Now, all of a sudden, you know, that's changed, but it was, it took time, it took time. We've talked a little bit about the, the NBC deal in 1999 when that opportunity. Oh, let me, let me back up. Let me back up. I forgot what I say. So now we're at the peak. We're growing. We've proven ourselves. Morale's great. Thrashers come on board. We get an email from Harvey or it might've been a phone call. It was probably between Harvey and Nick initially um, that, oh, we're going to, we're going to look for space outside of the CNN or CNN center for you. Do you know how that was received? in the office. It was like, wow, we really are right and stepchildren. It has nothing to do with how successful we are. Right. They don't want us in the building. It was, it was a blow. It, it, it was. And I, I was too deep into things at the time to recognize it. 
and understand the impact ultimately that it would have. But they moved us into a shitty part of town, into a warehouse where even after it was all remodeled, the sewer systems were so bad that half of that building smelled horrible half of the time. Like whenever it would rain, it would smell like you're in a, you know, outhouse for crying out loud. That was pretty demoralizing when in fact we had turned the corner and become so successful. By the way, the, the th thrashers. thrashers played their first game, October of 99. So the wheels are just totally coming off by that point in WCW two, but we talked a little bit about the NBC deal in 1999. Um, that was a big opportunity for WCW. Do you think if Ted was in total control and there was less of a time Warner focus, would he have been a bigger advocate for that? 1000%. That's why I was so shocked. You know, because Harvey couldn't make the call. I, again, I didn't understand the political dynamics that existed in 1999. I just didn't. I was naive. I thought things were pretty much the status quo, the way they'd been for years. And Ted was still the guy that was going to call the final shot. So when I would, brought it to Harvey and Harvey said, oh, we got to run this up the flagpole, I went, cool. I knew what Ted was going to do. I believed I knew. It didn't get to Ted. Well, got to, I, Joe, got to Joe Yuva. Mm. Joe Yuva was a head. It, it ended up becoming a very powerful person in the world of television. Joe Yuva got a hold of it because he was head of uh, ad sales at the time. And Joe, Joe Yuva said, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to turn a property on, on NBC. Uh, what? <laughs> yeah, it sucked. Do you think a lot is written about the bookkeeping of WCW and Guy Evans book? Do you think that? Ted got involved with the business enough to know how all that was going down or no. You know, Dick Cheatham, our, our friend Dick would really be the one that could speak to that the most. But what I've been told just recently, like within the last year or two, and some of it from Dick was that it was all cash flow with Ted. There's very little equity. It was all cash flow and debt. So I I don't know. I, I can't answer that. I think Ted, because I've known people like Ted, quite a few of them actually. I think Ted was very top line focused. Yeah. But I don't think he was financially prone to be analytical. I think he had a strong instinct as an entrepreneur and I think he was top line focused. And I doubt other than the headlines that Ted was really that familiar with the financials of any of his divisions. Let's talk a little bit about when you're going to take a bit of a sabbatical, we'll call it in 1999. Do you pick up the phone and call Ted? No. Did it cross your mind? Nope. I would have never done that. You wrote in your book that he was a personal reference for you in school and helping secure a deal with one of the biggest names in NASCAR. Can you tell us about that? Gosh, I forgot all about that till you just said that. Yeah. Um, I'm going to put a date on it. I'm going to call it 2002, maybe three. My then business partner, Jason Hervey and I had an idea to do a non-scripted competitive uh, NASCAR reality project where, you know, we'd follow a driver event, 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 but really what we were focusing on the story aspect of that idea, um, because we knew we couldn't cover the race. There was too many, too many reasons why that wasn't possible, but we could be on the track and we could be in the pit. So I wanted to do a deal. We, I shouldn't say I, we, Jason, and I want to do a deal with Jeff Gordon or somebody of his stature. We were working with a, a guy by the name of Paul Buccieri. Paul Buccieri then was an executive at Fox. He has since moved on. I think he's still the top executive in A&E. At least he was a couple of years ago when I t spoke to him last. Very high up. In, I don't think you can get any higher in A&E. But Paul was young at that time and somebody that we had worked with. We worked with Paul on the Endemol show at Hilton 
one of the first uh, non-scripted shows that Jason and I produced. We produced through Endemol. Paul Buccieri was the executive then at Endemol and then had since moved to Fox. So we went to Paul because he was one of us, you know, young guy, entrepreneurial, just in a very good friend, pr primarily of Jason's more so than mine. And we went to Paul and said, hey, what do you think about a NASCAR reality project? Paul went, wow, yeah, I think, you know, Fox was very interested in NASCAR at the time and said, yeah, see if you can make something happen. So, okay, we have an idea, a basic idea of what that reality show is, look like, is going to look like. Now we need, we need a driver, somebody that everybody knows. And it was like Jeff Gordon was the guy at that point in time. Even people that weren't necessarily big-time NASCAR fans knew who Jeff Gordon was. So we set about trying to figure out how to get to Jeff Gordon. Well, I found out through just friends of friends that have friends in NASCAR, um, Jeff Gordon's stepfather, I, for the life of me, I can't remember his name right now. Maybe Dave Silva can look it up while we're telling his story. Um, Dave, Jeff Gordon's stepfather handled all of Jeff's business. Whatever is is is, is uh, endorsements, his sponsorships, whatever, it all came through Jeff's stepfather, John Bickford. John Bickford. John Bickford. Thank you very much. So I thought, well, I'm gonna. I can't call Jeff Gordon. He'll never pick up the phone. But I'll call John Bickford. Just why not? So I called John and and had never met him before. We got along. You know. Down to earth, Southern guy, you know, NASCAR guy, no pretentious bullshit. You know, we got along on the phone. He said, sure, come on out to Charlotte. I'll show you around. So Jason and I flew out to Charlotte and uh, John showed him very super nice guy, super nice guy. Like I said, very unpretentious. And we sat down to, to talk business. He showed us around and showed us around the shop and all the Jeff stuff and all that kind of stuff. Jeff wasn't there. And, uh, we sat down and do business and he says, Oh, you, you know, you used to work at Turner Broadcasting. I said, Yeah. He goes, WCW, huh? I go, yeah. He goes, Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, wrestling's popular. I liked it. Grew up watching whatever he told me. Grew up watching. He goes, So you work for Ted Turner? And I said, Well, yes. You know, not directly, but yes. He goes, think he'd give you a reference? <laughs> I looked at Jason. It's like, now what do I do? I said, well, I don't know, John, I'll, I'll reach out and see. And Jason and I left the meeting and Jason says, what are you going to do now? I said, I'm going to call Ted. All he can, all he can do is say, no, right. it's not going to cost me anything. I didn't call Ted directly. I, I, I have too much respect. I had too much respect for him. Still do, but I don't have his number any longer. I used to have his number then, but I said, I'm going to call Bill because Bill and Ted, in fact, I just talked to Bill Shaw a month or so ago. And I think, Last week was Ted's 85th birthday, and Bill Shaw was one of the few uh, because the Ted's Ted's dealing with some issues. So the group of people that get invited to his party gets smaller and smaller and smaller every year, and Bill's still one of those people. But I called Bill and I said, "Hey, Bill, you know this is long after you know I've been gone from WCW now for a while." I called Bill and I said, "Bill, I need a Bill was still there." I said, "Bill, I need a favor. I got this deal and." Jeff Gordon's dad, and he said if I could get a job reference or performance reference that I'd he'd do the deal. And Bill said, let me call you right back. 20 minutes later, he said, yep, give uh, whoever you're to, give John Bigford, whoever you're talking to. He said, give whoever you're talking to this email address, and we'll take it from there. And Ted gave me a great reference. And we ended up doing the deal with Jeff Gordon. Well, I wish he was here today because we'd be doing a deal for Miracle Maid. I know you were sleeping good once you landed that deal with Jeff Gordon, and you're sleeping better than ever thanks to our friends at Miracle. What we like about Miracle, and there's a lot to like, first of all, it's cleaner than the sheets you've been using, but it also helps you get a better night's sleep because these sheets are silver infused. Yeah, we're talking about Miracle Made. This was all inspired by NASA. Silver infused fabrics that create temperature regulating bedding. So you sleep at the perfect temperature all night long. Not only that, but it's also much more sanitary than your old sheets. You see, it turns out there's more bacteria on your sheets right now than there are on a toilet seat. That's why you get acne and allergies and stuffy noses. It's all just gross. Miracle Ray, Miracle Made can help you with that though. They've got a whole line of self-cleaning, eco-friendly bedding. They got sheets and pillowcases and comforters. 
and they all prevent 99% of bacteria and they require three times less laundry. It's all about the silver baby, but the self cooling properties in these silver infused prop fabrics that have been inspired by NASA. That's what helps you stay asleep and fall asleep and, and, and enjoy a restful sleep. We've talked about that a lot, how we want to be cool when we sleep. Well, this is a one, two punch because they've also got silver. Not only do they keep you cool, but 99.7% of bacterial growth is eliminated because of the silver, no more gross odors. And how about this? They're also luxuriously comfortable, even more comfortable than what you might find in a five-star hotel. Miracle sheets are a perfect gift for anyone, friends, family, spouse, whatever. Who doesn't want to sleep better? Who doesn't want to sleep cleaner? Stop sleeping on bacteria. That's what you're doing. It can clog your pores, cause you breakouts. Just sleep clean with miracle. Go right now to try miracle.com slash 83 weeks. Try it today or gift it to someone special this holiday season. We've got a special deal for our listeners. Check this out. Save over 40%. And if you use our promo code at 83 weeks, you'll also get three free towels and save an extra 50%. By the way, Miracle is so confident in their product, it's backed with a 30 day money back guarantee. So if you're not 100% satisfied, you get a full refund. So upgrade your sleep with Miracle Made. Go right now to trymiracle.com slash 83 weeks and use the code 83 weeks to claim your free three piece towel set. You'll save 70% off. And again, trymiracle.com slash 83 weeks to treat yourself a friend or a loved one this holiday season. So Eric, we got tons of questions about Ted Turner. Um, I guess one of the first ones would be, do you think, do you think somewhere Ted's happy wrestling still on TBS and TNT? I'd like to think so, but I honestly think that Ted, and again, I, I think this because of things, bits and pieces of things that I've heard from people who are closer to Ted. I think he's just so disappointed in the way everything went and embarrassed in some respects because of what's happened, especially to CNN. CNN's my prediction, and you know how I am on predictions. I am so on the money. It's almost ridiculous. I'm like Nostra fucking Damas sometimes when it comes to wrestling, at least. Um, I think he's embarrassed. CNN's going to get sold off for parts. It's going to get broken up into little pieces. It just moved out of the CNN center recently. And it's going to be sold off in for parts. And I think Ted is, and I don't know about now because Ted is dealing with some age related issues. I don't know how, what he thinks about anything, but I do know at one point in the last 10 years, he was so disappointed at everything that I doubt that he pays any attention. What's your fondest think, memory of Ted? That meeting in, in 95. When, when you got nitro, I went, there, I went there for one conversation and ended up having another one and walked out the door and went, now, what the fuck do I do? That was magic. If I could have that moment back, just, just for a minute, it would be awesome. Not the meeting. Yeah. But when I walked out of that office, just before feel like I even again. got back to my own office on the other side of the CNN center, I was on the atrium there. And I had to stop. I just, I can't go back to the office because somebody's going to ask me a question and I mean, I'm not even going to know how to respond, but I stopped <clears throat> on that atrium and I was looking down in, in the CNN center at the time. I don't know what it looks like now, but on that particular atrium that connected the North tower from the South tower, um, you would look down and you'd see the um, CNN shop, CNN store and look up and all you'd see was, you know, 14 stories of CNN center glass walls. So you could see all the people working inside of the CNN center. And I just remember that moment going, what in the world am I going to do now? And looking back, that was such a magical moment. I'd love to have that back, but it was that, you know, I think it was those phone calls with Ted listening to a, dare I say childlike in his enthusiasm, Ted Turner, you know, putting over WCW and I, that was, that was pretty cool. Fun question here from uh, James. He wants to know, did Ted attend Starcade 97 or the Georgia dome nitro where Goldberg won the title? I don't think so. I don't think so. Scott Norris wants to know, did you ever approach Ted about being on nitro in a storyline? 
Uh, no, because I understood that Ted wasn't interested in being in a storyline. He had no problem showing up and showing support, being very public in his support, but he didn't want to be uh, included or involved in any kind of a storyline. Instagram a wrestling historian wants to know, did Ted ever pitch ideas or storylines? No. <laughs> Uh, I wish I think that could have been crazy fun. Ted was, Ted was out there and he was fearless. That's fun. A creatively fearless person who loves wrestling, who has a vision and is an entrepreneur. Yeah, baby. It would have been fun. I don't know what it would have come out of it, but it would have been fun. Uh, what was he like as a leader? I don't think there's been one like him since he led by example. Ted failed at a lot of shit. Yeah. He kept trying. He, he, he led by example. That's one of the things. And I think I talked about it in guy Evans book. You know, we were all led to believe that the mer the initial merger time Warner and Turner was going to be this great merger between this old legacy media company, Time Warner had been around forever. It was so powerful and had such deep roots. And I'll never forget, man. I was at Terry McGurk's house, Christmas party, standing four feet away from uh, Joe Levin. And who's the AOL guy, the tall guy, Steve, uh, whatever his name was. Can't remember his name. That's, <laughs> that's where AOL is. But listening to them talk about, you know, this is going to be the greatest merger in the history of mergers. You've got the strength and the foundational strength of time Warner and it's deep roots and Hollywood and libraries. And you've got the entrepreneurial instinct of Ted Turner and the entire Turner organization. That part was true because the people underneath Ted Scott Sasso was a wild man. He was a genius, but he was crazy. He was not cut out of a corporate cloth at all. He was smart enough to play in that space, but he was an entrepreneur's entrepreneur and a creative one at that with vision. That's why he was Ted's number two. He was probably only 30 something at the time, but he was Ted Turner's number two. He was the heir apparent. Everybody that Ted surrounded himself were entrepreneurs and risk takers. Where do you find that today? I don't know. What I hear, because I'm not in the world, but the little bit of, you know, even when I was pitching shows with Jason Hervey and I'm pitching to people who are now in that corporate environment, even in the entertainment business, which historically was still kind of like the wild, 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 wild west of corporate environments. But even when I was pitching shows, you know, Jason, and I would always say, you're not, you're pitching to people who are job scared. They only make fears based out of, they only make decisions based on fear. Fear of loss, you know, they'll buy something. If they're afraid if they don't, somebody else will, they'll buy it. But if they're afraid, but if they buy it, they're and they, if they're afraid they're going to be judged by it, nah, they get wishy-washy. And, and in today's it's why I'm so glad I'm out of the television business. So glad I'm out of it because it's become so risk adverse. It's like working for a bank. It's not fun anymore. And it hasn't been fun for about 10 years really eight or 10 years. It's be, it's becoming less. And I talk to people that are in the business every single day. I mean, I don't talk to them every day, but they're in the business every single day. And some of them are friends of mine that I talk to frequently and they hate it. They absolutely hate it. It's not fun anymore. What's one if of your creative person and you're in the television business, unless you're at the very top, if you're, you know, the top one half of 1%, you're fucking miserable. Did you ever see, uh, we've heard a lot, you know, we sort of compared and contrasted at least for a moment, him and Vince, him being Ted, we've heard about Vince McMahon flip outs and freak outs and dressing people down. And you ever see Ted get emotional in a management circumstance like that? Well, I certainly didn't see it, but I've never heard of it either. Yeah. I've never heard, never heard about him having an emotional outburst Yeah, ever. What's one of the biggest, uh, character traits of Ted's that you tried to emulate, do you think in your approach to business? To be fearless. Yeah. To not be afraid to fail. 
You know, no, it's him. interesting because we're, we're, you know, we're, you know, again, this is a wrestling show, or at least my involvement in the wrestling business. We go, yeah, but WCW failed. But man, I, first of all, I don't know that it failed, to be honest with you, but I don't believe it did, actually. But to work for a guy like Ted Turner, who your biggest sin was not trying, your biggest sin wasn't failing. As long as you learn something in the process and you can apply it, move along, young man, keep going, come up with something better. Where do you get to work for someone like that anymore? I, just, I don't, I don't know that it exists unless you're self-employed or you're running your own shop. Uh, Michael wants to know if you've ever been to Ted's Montana grill and what you thought about it. Yes. 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 Um, there's one in Bozeman, Montana. And Lori and I went up there two or three years ago. We don't, we go up to Bozeman once a, once a year, once every two years, just to hang out. Bozeman used to be a pretty cool town. It's gotten kind of like to be a suburb of LA now. So it's not quite as charming as it used to be, but there's some really good restaurants. And one of them is uh, Ted Turner's Bar and Grill. And Ted lives outside of Bozeman. He's got a ranch outside of Bozeman. So Laura and I went in there and, and I hadn't talked to Bill Shaw. This was several years ago now. And I hadn't talked to Bill Shaw in a long time. So I didn't, I wasn't aware of Ted's condition. Um, it, it's not uh, dementia and it's not Alzheimer's, but it's something kind of like both of them. Um, Ted doesn't get out much anymore. He doesn't get out at all anymore. And the people around him are very selective about who gets to see Ted and in what situation they see Ted in. Am I pronouncing it right? Louis body dementia. Is that yes. What it's called? Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't do interviews anymore or anything like that, but I didn't know all that a couple of years ago. So Lori and I go up there and I get to chatting with the bartender and uh, the lady looks to be about 40 or so. And we're, you know, we're three of us having a great conversation. And I say, just out of curiosity, do you ever see Ted or Teddy jr was one of Ted's sons who I was friends with pretty friendly with. I said, do you ever see Ted or Teddy? You know, do they ever come in anymore? And, and she said last, she had seen Ted about five years previous to that. And it was pretty clear that Ted was having a hard time, you know, just being out in public. And she said, he hasn't been in a sense. And I, it made me kind of sad, but yeah. you know, I, I still, whenever I, whenever I'm somewhere and I see a Ted Turner bar and grill, I'll go in and have a beer and a burger, bison burger, only bison. You know, Ted Turner still owns the largest Buffalo herd in America, 45,000 Buffalo he currently owns. I didn't know that. Yeah. He's one of the single largest landowners in the United States. And actually, my wife, Lori, Mrs. B, has a client who is a version of Elon Musk. He actually is hes building rockets. He is a rocket scientist. And about a year ago, he called me and said, hey, I know you used to work for Ted. Ted's got some property down in New Mexico that would make an ideal location for me to launch my next rocket. Do you think you can get to Ted and see if you can get permission for me or how I go about getting permission? I go, okay, this is going to be a challenge. Hey, Ted, I got a friend fires off rockets, you know, and, and, and Ted is very much of an environmentalist. If you read anything about, you know, a lot of his initiatives, very, very much of an, an environmentalist. And by that time, when I got that call last year or whenever it was eight months ago, I knew I wasn't going to be having a conversation with Ted. So I called Bill Shaw and I said, who's in charge of all of Ted's properties? And he gave me the guy's name and I called the guy. He goes, Hey, I know who you are. He'd evidently worked with Turner for a long time and he knew who I was. And he you know, was a fan of WCW at the time. And he's now in charge of all Turner's properties. So I explained the situation to him and he said, yeah, give me your guys an email address and I'll connect with them. And then I put the deal together. I didn't put the deal together. He put the deal together, but I, I facilitated the meeting and uh, I guess the guy ended up firing off a rocket on Ted's property down in New Mexico. A uh, quick Google search says that uh, Ted Turner is the fourth largest landowner in the United States. He owes, uh, he owns over 2 million acres. Uh, number three owns 2.1. Number two owns 2.2 and number one uh, owns 2.33, but still Ted Turner owns land in South Dakota, New Mexico, Nebraska, Montana, Kansas, 2 million acres. Uh, and yeah. a lot of that land that Ted bought was because 
Ted really wanted to bring back bison and bring them back as a commercial food source, which is one of the reasons why he, he built Ted's Montana Ted grill. Yeah. Because he, he sourced his own product and created a market for it. Um, but all that land that Ted owns, the vast majority of it, he owns some, some land down in the South too, like where he used to, but he used to own that land recreationally because he liked to quail hunt and ride horses and things like that. But all of his land out West are in prime bison, bison areas. We, uh, we got to at least talk about it. One last, uh, or I guess we'll do two more questions. Uh, there's a pretty, we all know that Vince really took his jabs at Ted Turner. He was punching up at Ted. He wasn't really talking about you. Uh, you weren't really, uh, someone who was acknowledged a lot by Vince McMahon, even though it's actually you pulling all these levers against him, not Ted, but still maybe one of the most famous pieces of business is when Vince took out an ad in the newspaper talking about the Turner merger. And, you know, as saying that shareholders should ask questions and I, it's really amazing to see Vince sell for lack of a better word like this for Ted and go after him in like this in the newspaper. what do you think of that? We're showing the ad right now. If you've never seen it over on YouTube, it says attention TBS stockholders. It's got what looks like a police sketch of Ted Turner. Does Ted Turner have a personal vendetta against the WWF? Tom Warner beware. So clearly Vince is trying to do what he can. what do you think of that? And what do you think Ted thought of that, that he had Vince on his heels like this? Uh, you know, I, I can't imagine what Ted was thinking other than probably chuckled. Uh, it was pretty juvenile, I guess, but I also understand Vince's side of it because if you're Vince McMahon and you've been getting your ass kicked for a couple of years now by Turner Broadcasting, and now at least on paper, Turner Broadcasting was going to become even more powerful than it already was, yeah, it'd be a cause for concern. Um, that's probably why Vince did it, is he was fearful. He was reacting to what appeared to be even a more, uh, more powerful Ted Turner. And that's the last thing that Vince probably wanted in that moment. But it was childish in the sense that it would have any impact. It was selling. He sold his ass off. What can you tell us about Ted Turner, the person? We've talked a lot about Ted Turner, the businessman today. Like, did Ted Turner like to have a cocktail? Did he enjoy the chase? Did he have some fun in his day? From what I've been told, not experienced, he loved to drink, he loved to party. And he wasn't afraid to get to know a, a woman or two. <laughs> <laughs> well, roll tight on that. Next week, we're going to be talking about Halloween Havoc 1998. We're coming off the disastrous Halloween Havoc pay per view. It was an amazing show, but it went off the air too soon for a lot of the folks who bought that pay per view. So we'll talk about the fallout from Halloween Havoc and then we'll get cooking on all things World War III 1998. We've also got Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. We're starting to do a square off one-on-one. -on -one. We know eventually we're going to get to that big three ring battle Royale, but it's an interesting show. There's no Goldberg. There's no Hulk Hogan. DDP's taking on Bret Hart in the main event. It's an interesting time in WCW. So we'll be talking about that next week. Love to have your questions about it here on the program. If you've got a question, you can ask it pretty easily. It's at 83 weeks on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook. The cheapest, easiest, best way to support the show is to like us and hit that subscribe button over on YouTube. It's 83 weeks on youtube.com. Lots of fun swag available for you now, uh, at 83 weeks, Uh, really, really fun stuff, including a new Ted Turner inspired t-shirt that I think you'll dig either, uh, lead follow or get out of the way of av all available now, 83 weeks, also want to mention if your business is looking to target men that are 25 to 54 years old, boy, we got them here. Are some of the same sponsors week in week out for years. Why is that? Well, because it really works. Find out how affordable it is to get your message in front of those dudes at, uh, advertise with, uh, Eric.com man. I never know what to expect when we sit down to click report record, but I had a great time talking about the current state of wrestling and even more fun paying tribute to Ted Turner. I want to thank everybody who showed up as a part of our live studio audience. Uh, shout out to Adrian who's in the group chat and Timothy and Nathan and, uh, the King was here and 
man, we had a lot of fun folks in here today. Some new names. Rusty was hanging out. Little Jimmy Sorensen's here. Greatly appreciate all of you guys showing up and showing out for us on a Sunday. Uh, Eric, this was a lot of fun. I'm looking forward to next week. And I guess I want to know, are you going to watch full gear next weekend? I'm watching full gear. Are you watching full gear? No. Nah. Okay. Well, no, unless look, unless something happens to give me a reason to expect that something is going to change. I'm just not really interested. I'm really not. I'm interested in the business of the wrestling business. I'm not as interested in what happens inside of the ring. And I just don't see anything really changing on the AEW side. So it's, it's hard for me. You know, if I was sitting around and the weather was lousy and I didn't feel well, and I knew I wasn't going to do anything other than sit the couch, maybe, but I wouldn't go out of my way. Not yet. Not, not at this point. Well, I'm going out of my way. I'm going to watch it. And if something crazy happens, it'll happen on Saturday night, this Saturday night, you and I will be discussing it next Sunday morning. And you'll hear it all next Monday, right here on 83 weeks with Eric Bischoff. Hey, Hey, it's Conrad Thompson here to tell you a little more about what adfreeshows.com is all about. Get early ad free access to more than a dozen of your favorite wrestling podcasts every single week, starting at just nine bucks. That's less than 20 cents an episode each month. And yes, you can listen to them all directly through Apple podcasts or your regular podcast apps. How easy is that? Ad free shows also has thousands of hours worth of bonus content and docu-series like title chase, Eric fires back conversations with Conrad and the insiders plus new series like the book with David Crockett, Monday mailbags with Mike Kyoto and Nick Patrick and a whole lot more. And you want to talk about early, you can't get any earlier than listening to the shows live. You can be a part of the live studio audience as we record the podcast. Plus ride shotgun alongside your favorite childhood heroes for live watch alongs, Q and A's and other interactive experiences every single month. Come on now, see for yourself what thousands of other wrestling fans from around the world have discovered that adfreeshows.com is the best value in wrestling. Check it out today. And hey, when you do, the first week is completely free at freeshows.com.